We start right at seven, so we've got a couple of seconds to go here before the official time starts. <laughs> All right, close enough. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name's uh, Kevin Murdoch. Uh, I am currently acting mayor, and so I'll be chairing this meeting and the following meeting as a uh, our Mayor Nils Jensen is out of country at the moment. Um, before I begin, before we begin the meeting officially, I just want to uh, recognize we had a young member of our staff, uh, Bryce Curry, who passed away over the weekend. And uh, I just want to take this moment on behalf of Council just to recognize Bryce and to express on behalf of Council and the staff our condolences to his family and to his co-workers and to his friends who were deeply affected by this loss. So our thoughts and prayers are with you all tonight. And with that, we will start the official meeting, which is the regular meeting of Committee of the Whole. Uh, I want to start by just acknowledging that we are holding this meeting on the lands which are the traditional territories of the Coast and Strait Salish peoples. Specifically, we recognize the Lekwungen speaking people, today recognized, today, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, and that their historic connections to these lands continue to this day. I also want to just point out that uh, we do live stream this, uh, this meeting, and that goes into uh, archives, so if you have um, uh, if you're speaking, that your, uh, your comments will be recorded in posterity. Um, I also want to just make a comment before we begin that we have uh, 13 pretty substantial items on the Committee of the Whole agenda, uh, followed by uh, 20 pretty substantial items on the Council agenda. So we'll be trying to move through the procedural pieces reasonably quickly. Uh, we'll certainly give everybody who wants to speak to any issue uh, the time they need to <coughs> ask questions and make comments. So with that, I uh, also want to just, uh, you heard the squawk, we have two councillors, Councillor Nay and Councillor Kirby, who are not able to join us tonight, uh, but will be joining us uh, via speakerphone. So uh, I'm just going to stop here and make sure that uh, they're on mute, I believe, they have to unmute themselves. Uh, Councillor Kirby and Nay, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Uh, starting with item number one uh, is the Mayor's Task Force on Public Engagement. And I'm going to have uh, Councillor Nay, I think, is going to do the opening uh, talk on this. Um, just for people in the audience, this has been a, uh, a task force that was originally started back in uh, October, November of 2015. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, earlier reports. It was really restarted this year um, to kick it off and, and come forward with the Folsom Report. And that report uh, is uh, coming to Council or to Committee for the first time today and we're very much looking forward to going through it. Uh, so Councillor Nay, actually uh, maybe I'll just acknowledge as well uh, just the members. So here I'm not sure who all is here today but we have Naomi Pope, Esther Patterson, Jan Mears, Andrew Appleton, Councillors Eric Zelka, Tara Nay, and Michelle Kirby were all members of this uh, working group and, or task force and uh, we also had their support, the support of Katie Hamilton uh, who's here tonight as well uh, as a consultant. Uh, so Councillor Nay, uh, with no further ado, I believe you wanted to start off the comments and then you'll hand it over to a couple of the other members. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Yeah, so I just wanted to make some brief comments uh, and thank the um, task force and um, other members. And then I just want to make um, um, one sort of uh, high level uh, point about the report before I pass it on to the task force members and then to uh, Ms. Hamilton to uh, provide a presentation, if I may. So. First of all, I just want to uh, thank the other uh, task force members who worked on this project early on to develop the, really the foundation of what the report is we're presenting today. And so um, Councillor Croft, um, Kareem Green, and Mike Wilma um, did uh, some work early on, and we're very grateful for that. And then to our task force members um, who've already been mentioned, um, 
uh, Andrew Anderson, Jan Mears, Esther Patterson, Naomi Pope, and our two counselors, uh, Counselor Kirby and Zelka. I, I really want to thank you. I, I think that the strength of this task force has really been in the diversity of uh, perspectives that have been at the table. So I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for your, for your efforts, for your smarts, and uh, for your commitment to bring this uh, phase of the project uh, to completion in, in a timely manner. Um, and then I want to thank Katie Hamilton, our consultant who has been instrumental in shaping um, the nature of this report, her experience, her expertise, and her ability really to get the nuance um, of this work to fit for our community really has been outstanding. And then I really want to thank staff because their contributions have made the nature of this report quite quite unique and I think um, um, uh, valuable. So I, I want to thank you for your openness, your forthright uh, observations, um, and the receptivity to this project as we had consultations um, with staff. That too has been invaluable. And. Um, and then just one high level point I'd like to make before passing this over to uh, the task force members and consultant is that, as I mentioned, this work builds on the foundations of previous work and um, recommendation, recommended activities, and many of which, by the way, were um, implemented early on with the previous um, public engagement task force. But here, we offer something quite different. We offer a framework, not just a list of activities. And it's this framework that will offer opportunities to create a culture of um, engagement in Oak Bay, where it, engagement is sustained and where um, values like transparency and communication, public participation can be expected. So where the public has not just a vote, but a, a voice in how local government works. And this means two things, and I, I think this speaks to a couple things that are very unique about um, this, this report, is that to develop a culture, it's not just about having one person who can do public engagement. Public engagement, when done well, is everybody's business. And, and that means that all departments will, um, and, and those who are leading them and involved in delivering service will have capacity, so that's in engineering or planning or IT, and that all staff and frontline workers and senior management, as well as elected officials, are able to do their work through an engagement lens. So I, I think that really speaks to what is particularly unique um, and really exciting for, for the community um, uh, in, 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 in the future. And then um, finally, my final point I want to speak to is that, is that um, should this, can, can council hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, okay, as I just uh, had another call coming, I didn't know what was going on there, I apologize. But um, should council receive this uh, report, um, it will be for the next council to develop a plan and budget. That's not what we have done here. It's not what the aim of this project was. Uh, but that means that the next council will need to provide the leadership, the direction, and provide uh, resources to develop processes, governance mechanisms, and staff capacity to do this work. And importantly, it's not an overnight project. This is a process that will require sustained leadership from both council and, and partnership with both council and staff. So with that, I'm gonna pass this over uh, to, um, to the task force members. And I very much look forward to comments and feedback um, and questions from uh, the public and the committee. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ney. And yeah, I'd like to get to uh, to the public input uh, fairly quickly. And I'm just looking for uh, as much uh, either overviews as we can from the other members that are. Uh, is there a scheduled list of speakers at this point? Councillor Zelka can facilitate that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Mayor. 
Much appreciate uh, this opportunity, and uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Nain. Um, uh, I understand the uh, intent uh, in terms of, a, of, a, of a, uh, amongst uh, the, the task force members is that uh, each of us would introduce essentially, uh, uh, shall we say, our highlight uh, of, of, of the report briefly, since it's a, it's a very uh, packed agenda, and then we would finish with, um, with uh, our, our, our consultant, um, our ABLE consultant, who will then provide uh, um, a wonderful uh, a level of depth that uh, that most of us reach towards. So for, for, for myself, if I could, uh, the, the item I wanted to, to focus on is within what's called the toolkit on page four for those who have, have a chance to ch uh, get to the agenda. It's the actual uh, core values that uh, this whole process is based upon. And uh, these were some of the things that, that I found most, uh, most interesting uh, as a fundamental uh, things that are, that for me, it really is driving the whole process and, and, and is, what is what attracted me to the framework that will be explained shortly. But the fundamental core values, every person who is affected by a decision has a right to be involved in the decision making process. I think that's a reasonable value that we can all agree to with. Uh, public participation includes the promise that the public's contribution will influence the decision. The uh, participation promotes sustainable decisions of all the participants. These are some of the fundamental uh, values, uh, um, the first three. There's the four more. Public participation seeks out and facilitates the involvement of those potentially affected or interested in a decision. I think these are just some, some, some reasonable things. The public participation seeks input from all in designing how they wish to participate. Public participation provides participants with the information they need to participate in a meaningful way. And that's gonna be a, a, a part of the work that, that we'll have, we'll all have on, on, on trying to come up with the many value, uh, many uh, ways of doing this. And finally, public participation communicates to participants, and I think this is the most important one, how their input affected the decision. Uh, those are the ones I wanted to highlight in, 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 my, in my input, and I'll pass over to. Are the there any other members of the committee that wish to speak? Yes. If you just state your name for the record, and thank you, Councillor Braithley. Sure. <laughs> Try it again. There we go. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, good evening. My name is Naomi Pope, and um, I joined, I just want to provide a, uh, a very short perspective on, um, on the process of the task force. So I joined um, on the last restart of the process. So I was very new to the file, um, and so I just wanted to comment that sort of my perspective on the process was, you know, how open and inclusive it was um, in terms of the objectives and the background. So. Um, and I thought, you know, wow, when, when sort of learning and sort of, um, you know, acting upon this and really, um, you know, when we, you know, shared all of our different perspectives, it, um, it was really, the process itself, you know, was also part of the product that we see here in terms of the report and the toolkit as well. And it's one of those things where, as I started going to the pop-ups, you know, getting involved in it and having those conversations. It wasn't just the conversations from the task force, which were fantastic, but it was also getting out there into the community, right? So standing there with the boards, having the conversations, and just sort of feeling that spark of that engagement happening as well. So I just wanted to comment that that was, that was so useful and um, that the spirit of the community, I think, lies within the report itself. And um, so I just wanted to add that comment as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pope. Next. I'm Andrew Appleton. Ooh, that's really loud. Uh, a member of the task force. Um, in terms of highlights for me, uh, one thing I'd like to, to point out, and I'd like to specifically direct my, my comments actually to staff, which is I, I currently work for the province, but I have previous to that I was municipal staff, and so I've, I've sat in that, in that spot, and I really uh, uh, want to underline the significance from my perspective as a task force member of having the participation of staff, the active participation of staff in the, in the process that we went through, getting their input, getting their feedback. I think want everybody to know on staff that people, that the members of the task force clearly recognize that any time something is put out that may involve work and may evo involve extra tasks for anybody, that you know, we, we recognize that there are things there that, uh, that will involve resources that need to be resourced, that need to be adequately supported to be implemented. But I think that I can speak for the, 
the entire task force when I say that uh, we very much hope that the tools that are presented for staff and the, and the toolkit that's presented in the report um, is of use to you, that it speaks to you, and that it, and that it helps you in your conversations in the community. So we really appreciate your, your support of the process, and I think that this is a, a significant step forward as far as the overall uh, mindset of civic engagement for the district. Thank you, Mr. Appleton. I, I'm, although that was very, very positive, I'm going to remind people to direct the comments through me just because it helps keep everything I can on to <laughs> her. Hard to, hard to complain about that when you're just, you're just praising them, but there you go. Uh, is there anyone else before Ms. Hamilton comes up? Ms. Patter? Thank you, members of council. My name is Esther Patterson. I'm, I speak often at council, but I was also a member of the task force, and it, it was it was a good experience. We, you know, a, a lot of folks around the community appreciated the task force getting out and going to them. So that was that was a new initiative, and it was good. Um, I've already stated certainly how much I value IAP two standards. I know that they can work. Um, I think the the only thing I could say to add to the comments. Uh, of my, my uh, colleagues here on the committee is uh, really to quote um, Colin Powell. And he said, excellence is not an exception, it's a prevailing attitude. Well, so is public engagement. So I think we've, we have, with Katie Hamilton's uh, assistance, created the su practical support tools for staff and to help us as a community, but it really is about us having the right attitude to really make it work. Thank you. I think, uh, I think you're right, Ms. Hamilton. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, good evening, your acting worship, council, uh, members of staff. Thank you for the opportunity tonight. It's been my pleasure um, to work with the Mayor's Task Force on Public Engagement. Um, in developing both the recommendations that are before you tonight as well as the toolkit that we hope will serve the organization in the future. Um, I won't take up too much of your time. It's a warm July evening and there is a number of items on the agenda. Um, one of the things I wanted to do tonight though was provide a little bit of context for the work and the process that's been undertaken over the past few months. And I think it's um, public participation and municipal public engagement frameworks and toolkits are becoming commonplace across Canada. Um, in the province of Alberta, they're actually required under legislation that every municipality must have one, and I think we're seeing that as a growing trend here in British Columbia. Um, and as we've said before, it's important local government decisions are informed by the people they affect, and we have changing expectations amongst our citizenry, uh, we have new technology, and we are now seeing new methods and best practices across the board in terms of how we engage our communities in decision making as well as just routine service delivery. Um, municipalities are also changing. We have big decisions. Um, the complexity of those decisions are changing. It used to be that municipal departments were somewhat black and white. Parks issues were parks issues and engineering issues were engineering issues, but now we see social issues threaded through some of those departments. We see climate change impacting our operations. How we do our work is changing, and so the way we engage our communities in those conversations is also changing as a result. And I think there's a, a growing recognition that diversity of perspective helps make better de decisions, and we have a responsibility in government of seeking that diversity out. Um, in an effort to support our decision makers and our staff in providing the best services and programs um, possible. And we do this in, uh, I think, the intention of growing capacity within our community, um, drawing on the community expertise, which was a point that came up repeatedly here in Oak Bay, having such a, a well-educated and professional community uh, that brings a lot of strength and capacity uh, to the community and building that trust and relationship with government so that we see ourselves as partners in service delivery and program development. In working with the task force, oops, there's a, it's not supposed to look like that. Um, 
Uh, working with the task force, we really tried to respect the feedback that has been uh, heard over the course of uh, many years. Uh, public engagement continues to be a focus uh, within the municipality, um, but really building from the feedback that had, had been heard uh, recently and, and over the years. Um, and we really tried to hone in on developing a strategy and a framework that was practical that was tailored to the needs of Oak Bay. Um, it's not a cookie cutter type of approach. Every community is different. Uh, every municipality operates a little bit differently. But we really tried to strike a balance between what were the practical tools that we felt the organization needed to be efficient and consistent and thoughtful in, in engaging the public, but also how do we really support um, our elected decision makers in making great decisions and what are those considerations that they have yourselves in guiding uh, the municipality going forward. And so really trying not to get too caught up on all of the theory and, and uh, practice, but what are the, the values, the foundation that's needed to support decision makers, and what are the tools and techniques that staff need to really support the council and the organization. So in terms of what we did, um, we tried to test a few different methods that Oak Bay has not done before. Uh, we wanted to go to the people, we wanted to hear from folks perhaps we haven't ne necessarily heard from before, as well as provide an opportunity for everyone across the uh, community to provide a perspective and, and input. Um, we interfaced with close to 400 uh, citizens within the community, um, those who chose to participate and those who we just happened upon at various community events. Uh, we had pop-up engagement booths at recreation centers, libraries, on street corners, uh, Camas Festival, Nosh Festival. Um, and then we also had the great fortune of drawing on the expertise and experience of the senior leadership team, as well as staff and corporate services. So really wonderful opportunity to hear from historical experience, um, both here in the district and, and from those new staff that have come to the district in terms of the tools and, and that, that they need to support the organization. And then just recently this week, um, out at the Oak Bay Night Market, just to provide an update and a touch base with the community on where things are at. So I won't walk through all of the recommendations. You'll see from your report, you have over 50. Um, some sort of low-hanging fruit in terms of the ability to implement in current work plans or budgets, and then some that will require greater consideration as an organization over time. Um, but definitely some strong themes that have emerged through our conversations with staff, the community, and the elected officials. Um, a real strong desire to see uh, decision-making processes uh, sort of clarified. Um, I definitely would say there is a sense that folks would like earlier uh, notification of upcoming decisions. They would like to understand the process by which decisions are made so that they can understand their opportunity to provide input into those processes and also a desire to know how their input was used and what decisions were made. So closing the loop with the community on that. Uh, building off uh, Councillor Ney, cultivating a culture of citizen-centric service and engagement. Um, there was a really strong correlation between the interface between customer service and broader engagement. So that ongoing relationship, the experience you have when you pick up the phone and you call District Hall and talk to staff, um, what responsiveness you get to an email or a concern that's raised, and how that interrelates or informs your ongoing engagement experience. Um, building organizational capacity to support increased public participation, so consistency and uh, presenting as one uh, district was really uh, also a common thread, not having to recalibrate as a citizen um, how each department perhaps might engage, but having some level of expectation about how consistently the district uh, engages with its citizenry. Um, aligning and prioritizing public engagement efforts to issues of greatest interest and impact. So this, there was a lot of congruence with earlier engagement within the community, uh, as well as the 2016 uh, satisfaction survey. A lot of interest in land, development, building issues, budget, and strategic priorities. So the citizenry is actually really pushing to have greater involvement in larger, high impact um, decisions or uh, development, and earlier involvement where possible. Also a desire to see uh, the organization and the district go beyond the minimum legislated requirements where possible. So in terms of notification, greater notification. Um, if we can increase um, the, the number of channels or the varieties in terms of receiving information, that makes it easier for folks to participate. 
Um, integrating public engagement efforts as a key component of project management and planning. And so we, we know from experience that not only do um, our communities uh, provide great input in terms of decisions in front of council or in front of the organization, but also great support for implementation. And so as we anticipate the needs of the community in implementing a project or a program, how can we work together to do that? And then removing the barriers to participation. So there's some really practical recommendations within the report, and then there's some broader ones. But everything from um, how we provide information, uh, audiovisual here in this room, how the agendas are presented, there's a number of suggestions in relation to making it as easy and as accessible for folks. And then as we mentioned, closing the loop and demonstrating how input was used to inform decision making. And I think to build off earlier comments, um, the decisions that municipalities are facing aren't always easy and public participation doesn't always make them easier. It can often make them more difficult, but really important that we've been able to demonstrate what input was collected, how that input was considered in making those tough decisions and then reporting out on that. And so just a quick introduction to the public participation spectrum that you'll see within the toolkit. This is very commonplace within public sector agencies, municipalities included, and very common here in the capital region. So when we look at stakeholders and citizen expectations, this is considered generally the norm and I think is starting to really inform this evolving area for municipal engagement. Um, starting on the left, you'll see the inform, which is how we communicate over to the far side, which is empower, which is full delegated decision making, which in a municipal setting doesn't happen outside of sort of election periods every four years. So we find ourselves often in that middle, middle area. And I think the point of this spectrum is that this really helps us reinforce those roles with decision makers and staff in terms of really focusing in on how to have the best conversations with our, our community, guiding staff efforts to gather input to bring back to the council table, um, and having the strategic discussion around what input do we need to make a decision, how will that input be used, and um, who do we need to hear from, and then supporting staff with a toolkit um, and techniques so that they can support the organization in gathering that input. So in front of you, you've got a report from the task force that I was very grateful for the opportunity to help pull together. Over 50 recommendations for improving communications and public participation over time, as well as a toolkit for supporting staff, council, and public in having those discussions and uh, framing engagement efforts. And I think you are very well positioned as a district at this juncture, heading into a new term of council to inform not only strategic priority discussions, um, orientation of a new council, working with your senior leadership team and staff, as well as uh, the orientation for the new council to really use this as a guide and as a foundation for going forward. So I thank you for the opportunity and I know myself and the task force members are happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. So uh, the process here is we are gonna just take questions from council. Uh, Ms. Hamilton, you might as well stay there. If there's questions, you're probably going to be on, on task to answer them. You bet. And, uh, and if once we're done with the questions, then we can go to the public. If there's any questions or comments, we'll welcome those. Uh, I just want to recognize, again, we're almost halfway, half an hour into our meeting here, so I uh, want to keep the questions as brief as possible and the answers as, as brief as possible. And at the end of the day, we have to make a motion. Um, I believe there's some suggestions that Councillor Nay had. Uh, in terms of just referring some of this to staff and to priorities, but we'll get to that. But right now, we're just going to go and, are there any questions of Ms. Hamilton at this time? It helps having half of council on the task force, apparently. Um, all right, without, there's no more questions from council, then I will go to the public. Are there any comments? We've had a couple of pieces of correspondence, I believe. Uh, are there any further comments uh, to me at this time? Please come forward. Just. Uh, Usual process, just state your name and the municipality you reside in and, uh, and then feel free to say what you have to say. I'm James Sotanum, uh, South Oak Bay. Welcome. Uh, through you, Chair, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to clarify whether this is a council meeting or committee of the whole. This is a committee of the whole committee meeting. Of the whole. We're going into a special council meeting at the end of the committee of the whole meeting. Okay, so I uh, assume uh, through you, Chair, that I have uh, time to, to, to ask a few this questions. This is not a three minutes. Thing. Uh, you can, okay, you can thank speak. you. Thank you very much because uh, uh, this is a topic that to me it's very important. Uh, I submitted to you uh, uh, a few comments. I'm not going to repeat them. 
uh, but I certainly would like to, to offer a different perspective on the topic. Um, it may take a little, a few minutes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the, the and congratulate the, uh, the task force. I think the report is a beautiful report. It gives us a, a, a interesting insights. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the members. Uh, I'd like to thank the the, uh, the consultant, the chair, and, and everybody. I, th I truly think that the report I is beautiful. I would like to offer uh, uh, suggestions, though, if I may. If I may. Sorry. Just give me a second. Sorry, I missed the page here. One should never rely on technology. It's just a dangerous thing to do. I know. And it's, it's exactly part of my submission. Uh, I'm missing important uh, attachments the, uh, that I think should, should be included. And I'd like to read what they are. First, I'd like to see an introductory note by the mayor who is the proponent of the task force introducing the report. And I think the note must include why the report is relevant and timely at this point in council term, how the report and its finding relate to what has already been found in previous surveys. And I'm talking about the OCP survey and the satisfaction survey of 2016 uh, I remember that when those surveys uh, were done, we, we gather a lot of information as to whether it's important for the community, uh, including development and, and uh, 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 lots of things. One of the findings uh, uh, was that the community was really happy uh, uh, with the way uh, we interact with uh, the city. And uh, the mayor often refers to that so uh, I'm not sure if, I mean, what I feel is that some of the information we gathered, we already had. Um, another uh, attachment that I'm missing, and I'm not sure if it's an attachment or an introduction uh, of the report, is uh, a written statement by the mayor indicating that as the commander in, ch in chief, the district as a whole, and the district as a whole, are fully committed to implementing the report. It's a beautiful report, but we are talking about IAP2. It's a very ambitious model. Uh, I don't want to be sarcastic, but we are not in Denmark. We are in Oak Bay. We have a very limited budget. We have priorities. If we think carefully, we have your priorities followed by a number of priorities on a waiting list. So uh, my concern is we've got to be realistic. Um, another uh, um, attachment is uh, the tool used to collect information. Uh, I'd like to see, uh, I mean, I know we, this has to be an accessible, readable report, but there's no reference to, to the method used. We don't even have a copy of the form that was used to, 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 to gather information. This is basic. Uh, I, I'd like to, to see uh, uh, under what we heard from the community, uh, tabulated analysis and information collected. Uh, there's nothing uh, un under what we heard. We see two paragraphs. I mean, don't take me wrong. <laughs> Again, it's a beautiful par uh, uh, report, but what we hear see is minimum analysis followed by IAP2 that is, could be found on the internet, free of cost. Um, sorry, I, I'm trying to rush. Um, 
what what I'd like to see too uh, is some sort of information. We, uh, um, the group says we gathered hundreds and hundreds of answers from from uh, you know through the pop-ups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so was there any shortcoming? Did did we get any any you know negative reactions or any negative whatever we you, you, I, we see that we got suggestions and etc is there any shortcoming was there anything that would you know make us think twice and or you know have any suggestion um, just to just to finish I, I'd like to read a, 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 a what my what I'm trying to to say uh, I think it's going to be challenging uh, I think it's a valid document. I do think that it's not realistic. I think to to a certain point, we are being, and I'm saying we, uh, uh, we think we're being hypocritical. Uh, we're talking about engagement, but we have an agenda now that is absolutely crowded with important issues. Uh, I've been attending council meeting for the last four years Engagement is a recurrent, uh, recurring issue. Uh, I, I work, but I also work in a sense because I love. I'd love to contribute to council. I I love reviewing the issues. Forever this this weekend, I'd love to to have been able to review the King George Terrace application. I couldn't. I, I mean, there's almost is it thirty items in this agenda? I, I don't even know. I I can't. I mean, how can we talk about engagement, public engagement, in a beautiful IA2, uh, uh, IAP2, <laughs> when we have this agenda? How hypocritical is that? I mean, finally, I'd like to just to read a statement. I have issues with the fact that public the public engagement report was only produced this year, last year of council term election year, and it's now being presented to the community as part of a packed meeting agenda. Nothing concrete has been done about public engagement until now. Don't take me wrong, the public engagement report is a very good report, but in my opinion, it's also very unlikely that it will be implemented anytime soon. Oak Bay does not have the capacity and the money required to undertake the recommendations put forward by the task force. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sultanum. Are there others who wish to come and speak to the, please come forward. Again, just state your name and municipality. Uh, Curtis Hobson, Oak Bay. I just have a question for the consultant and uh, the people on the task force. Um, will I have the opportunity like I have with the Prime Minister of our country to ask uh, my political representatives a question in a public forum and get an answer. But is that part and parcel to this public engagement or not? Or is it, does it preclude that? Does it exclude it? Or is it encouraged? Is it discouraged? Maybe you could speak to that a little. Um, if the consultant wished to speak, is within this, there's, there are a number of recommendations uh, is there uh, can maybe speak to the uh, no not to, but just to this very specific question of because it is actually a tough one for us to manage we have a formalized structure of, of interacting with the public as a as a quorum uh, what have you addressed in here as ways of getting to that uh, through the chair uh, thank you and that it's a great question uh, thank you for asking it um, the toolkit and the recommendations don't preclude this organization from doing engagement in any way that it desires to do so. What it's intended to do is to provide a foundation to help you determine what is the best tool for the best uh, for a particular issue or a topic. Um, in my experience working with municipalities and local government um, across Western Canada, um, there is no predetermined tool for every issue. Every issue has its own considerations, its complexities. 
um, every council does as well in terms of what input again that they require and who they require it from and so what this is is to help do is to help you have conversations as a as a council and as a community but what are those appropriate tools we did hear from the community that one of their preferred um, ways of providing input continues to be through public meetings directly to the elected officials so in no way does it preclude that opportunity um, what it does do though is it does recommend more variety and more channels for providing input because that's not the only tool and what we do know is that there are uh, attending a public meeting and providing input directly within a council uh, room setting or in a town hall setting for the example can create barriers for some people to participate their preferences that they prefer to do it in a more anonymous way or on their own time because they can't attend a council meeting or, or a public meeting and so I think what what the task force is recommending is a variety um, don't hang your hat on just one tool, um, provide ample opportunity, ample notification, and as a council, have conversations about what are those types of issues that you feel are appropriate for those types of um, uh, public meetings and, and those that can be provided in a different way. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from the public or comments? One more person coming forward. Same routine, name and municipality, please. You can just say it now and, and oh, okay. write down afterwards. Uh, Anthony Mayor, South Oak Bay. Um, <clears throat> I might be a bit rambling here. I just got back into town and I've been uh, painting my fence and got all my paint off to rush up here. And I used to play baseball. And I've been chasing deer out of my garden. Never seen so many, I don't know how you imported so many in such short time. I've only been gone a week. Anyhow, um, I must admit I haven't read the report, but I'm trusting that it's a good report. <clears throat> but let's lose sight of the fact, it's, that's just it, it's a report. And it's a report by a task force, and we've had three task forces in the last seven years. And we had lots of recommendations, so Reports don't get it done. Action gets it done. Um, before I went away, <coughs> I wrote a submission about the last council meeting that had 14 items or so and four really important community issues in the summer months and everybody's away. Um, and there were other submissions too saying the same thing, that how in the heck could anybody in such short notice a couple of days look at all the issues that were on that uh, um, agenda, including an annual report of 82 pages. Um, lo and behold, after <coughs> uh, I went in to wash up, I looked at the agenda, and there's 40 more agenda items. <laughs> and I'm going, wait a minute, and, and one of them is a public engagement report. So I don't know, you know, I mean, we've had... Uh, um, ombudsman uh, investigation looking at the uh, terms transparency in the community. Uh, we've had some issues around freedom of information. Uh, we've had an investigation by the Privacy Commission saying that we shouldn't be w taking more than 30 days. Sometimes it's months, and sometimes it takes repeated uh, requests to get that, uh, the, the reply, and sometimes we don't even get a reply. So I think there is a real problem about consultation in Oak Bay, uh, community consultation in Oak Bay. So I'll, I'll wrap this up because I know we've got, you know, I'm hoping we get out of here to get a, a drink at some point. But um, maybe now we could at least start with uh, Councillor Bracewhite's uh, uh, last year's uh, resolution to hold a town hall meeting. That would be kind of nice so we can engage um, our councillors uh, who've now taken their discussion out of the minutes and now we have problems with webcasting. We can't hear them. I couldn't get the last meeting on uh, the webcasting meeting, and I know there's been uh, um, um, audio problems as well, so I think we need to get going here. That would be nice. Maybe, maybe there'll be so some solutions in a few months. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mears. Uh, is there anybody else from the audience who wishes to come forward to speak? All right, I don't see anybody else. So we'll come bring it back to uh, to the committee here, and uh, is there any? further conversation, uh, and if not, I think, uh, Councillor Ney, I was informed that you had a, a motion you wanted to make, so I'm happy to let you make that, but I'm just going to allow some conversation here first, uh, 
uh, if there's any other comments or questions from Council. Councilor Braithwaite. Thank you so much, um, and through you. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who's given input tonight. It's great. Um, I agree that this is a great report um, that has a lot of information in it. It's a very ambitious model. I would definitely concur with that. Um, one of my biggest concerns, um, uh, I mean, I look at I look at a lot of the uh, the recommendations, and I think that those are, as was said, very low picking low picking fruit that we could take and implement almost right away. Um, I believe that one of the people who wrote a letter said that the report transfers 90% of the workload and engagement responsibility to the staff, and that's one of my biggest concerns. So when I look at this, and I'm glad that Councillor Nay said at the very beginning yeah. that it's not something that we're going to be able to. Um, kind of tackle within the rest of this term. It will be something for the new council to um, to have a look at. But um, I think we have to be realistic um, that it can't be implemented overnight, and we have to um, really look at um, how we tie this in with our priority session and um, ensuring that we give staff the tools and the budget to be able to implement at least some of the recommendations throughout the report. So those are my comments. And I would look forward to the um, the motion that will come forward. Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Chair. Uh, I just um, I want to spend a very brief moment going over the history of where this actually came from. Uh, back in 2015, November 9th of 2015, uh, the mayor, using his own powers, established uh, a task force uh, of Councillor Croft, Councillor Zelka, and Jan Mears. To, to start the initial work on the um, a citizens' engagement uh, ta task force, so the task force on public engagement, excuse me. That started in 2015. The first report was uh, delivered to council on March 16th, 2016, and uh, unfortunately, that report was thrown back to the task force as needing more work. Uh, however, uh, uh, for those who's willing to go back into the record, uh, the um, IAP2 um, uh, model was introduced in that report. Uh, a next draft then came to Council on November 16th, 2017, um, and uh, that draft, uh, I'm not sure whether it actually got to Council or not, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, that basically led to the final initiative, which uh, brought forward um, the, 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 the final sort of constitu uh, constitution, constituted group that, uh, that involved uh, also the hiring of Katie Hamilton uh, for um, for, for bringing this forward. I just wanted to give a very, very brief overview of, of that, that the IAP2 sort of model has been there from the beginning. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add is that the title of the very first report that was brought to council was called Coffee with Councillors. Uh, the intent of it was actually rather small. I mean, uh, 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 th th this report, what I love about it is, 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 is how incredibly um, uh, all-encompassing it is and actually provides some incredible uh, uh, recommendations. The initial attempt was um, was to to simply look at something a little smaller, a little more, a li 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 maybe a, a biting off a little bit less, if you will. Um, by the Sorry, way, someone, just Councillor uh, Kirby or Councillor Nay, we can hear whispering in the background. If you could just mute your microphone for a, for a minute or two more, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Zelka. Oh, thank you very much, Chair. So, um, uh, uh, at the very beginning of this last mandate. Um, uh, I was hoping, uh, maybe like some others on, on, on council, that we would have um, um, town halls and we would have this, the, the, the more opportunities for public engagement. And um, uh, I don't know, I just didn't seem to get, get, get purchased. So I actually started my own uh, coffee with councillor sessions and that, uh, that uh, I was willing to stop in, a, in exchange for working with, uh, with, uh, with the task force. So I very much appreciate uh, uh, the mayor bringing forward this opportunity to initiate this task force back in 2015 and come up with, uh, with a collective way where we can move forward um, where, where uh, uh, not one councillor was off doing his own thing. Um, so I very much look forward to, uh, to uh, the motion uh, coming forward and pr uh, providing a way that is scalable, depending on how much money, how much intent, how much uh, attention we have, and also something that is evolutionary. That's what I very much appreciate about this model. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. And uh, Councillor Kirby, uh, you have been silent so far on this, but you were on the task force. Is there anything you want to add here? Um, I just would like to say that um, I'm very pleased with the toolkit that's been provided. I think that um, it's really helpful to staff, and I think this is um, going to make a cultural shift uh, within Oak Bay and how we address all kinds of issues. Um, and I, I 
really am so grateful to um, Gady Hamilton for her work and the committee. I think we've um, got a really great product, and I'm uh, looking forward to supporting the motion when that's made. Well, we have to know what the motion is before we'll support it. I think is the the uh, as a councilor. Nate, well, did you? I'm <laughs> So assume it's supportive, yes, since it's coming from the chair. Um, Councillor Nade, did you have a motion that you wanted to bring forward at this time? Yeah, thank you, Acting Mayor. I just, uh, I just did have one comment before I make the motion, though. But um, it just in response to the observation that staff would be loaded with 90% of the work. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see that comment because it would be right. Staff is... Is, 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 the, is the entity that does do the work. The role of council is to provide the leadership, the policy direction, and approve you know, budgets and resources. But the, the idea of this, this framework is that it's really critical that, that council work in partnership with staff to develop the plan and then the budget that would follow to that. But, and that just as a reminder, is this is not a, a project that gets completed overnight. Uh, the plan would be put in place um, uh, in accordance to the will of the next council. So it, it's not just do it all, all at one time and overburden staff with, with an already very full agenda. So I just wanted to make that clarification. And, um, and then with that, um, Acting Mayor, I just have a quick question to staff before I make the um, before I make the motion, if I may. Through Go ahead. Yep. Acting Mayor to staff. Yeah, I, I just want to understand if we refer this uh, to staff, um, you know, who, who will review and then bring it back to the strategic priorities for the next council. Do we need to first have this? Um, um, received by council before doing that, or can we make that motion here at the committee? Ms. Varela? Thank you, Your Worship. We could re uh, recommend that council receive the report for information with subsequent recommendation to refer to staff and then on to the strategic planning session and budget 2019. That would be appropriate. Uh, Councilor Nady, to catch that? Yeah, then I'll make that motion as worded by staff precisely. So the motion is to receive the report, to uh, refer it to staff for comment, uh, and to refer it to a future priority session. And With estimates? the next council. Okay. Seconded. Is, is, are you done, Councillor Ney? Yep. Yep. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, Councillor Croft? Yeah, I haven't said anything, and I, I'd like to because I was part of the original 2011 task force at which uh, our uh, acting mayor was a member of that along with Corinne Green and was the nominal chair of the two presentations that we did. And I really do appreciate the work that the community has done on this task force to bring forward this report in its depth and breadth. And I think that we have to remember that um, public engagement can't be looked upon as a cost. It's an investment in community. It's what we do all the time to invest in the community so that the community is engaged and informed and that we know that with the feedback that we know what's going on. So I was happy to uh, second the motion. All right, thank you. Uh, I don't have any comments to add to this piece. Uh, so if, if there's no further seeing none, I will call, oh, Councilor Zelta. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. A question through you to staff. Um, uh, with this particular wording of a motion, uh, assuming, I guess, of course, it passes at council, uh, was there anything to preclude uh, staff from starting to work on it, or does it also need to be endorsed in some ways in terms of a policy? I just was wondering uh, whether staff would somehow feel they need to wait until uh, a policy uh, or, or estimates needs to uh, um, pass judgment on this. just wanted to ask about clarification on that, please. I'll try and answer that. Basically, we're receiving it as a, as, as a committee. Um, that doesn't do anything except receive it uh, by referring it to staff. It allows them essentially to go through it in time. They haven't really had a chance to look at the report, so this gives them a chance to look at it, identify some of the low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. that has been identified, and they can work away at that and bring back to council in future what they can do, and, and the things that have monetary costs will have to go through a priorities and budgeting process. Is that 
uh, that, that answers most of my questions. It's the items that, uh, many items in here that actually don't have a monetary cost, uh, such as modifying how the way we handle Twitter and social media, the way, you know, s setting up a Facebook page, whatever the, uh, uh, potentially that, that may or may not necessarily involve a cost. So it was those sort of things that uh, maybe once we get it, as it gets to council, we can talk about maybe uh, providing a, an, extra, an extra piece in there if, if it's needed to, to just let staff know that uh, if they want to get started on something, they're welcome to because uh, there's so many things in here that I would love to see started sooner instead of later. Thank you. So just to be very clear, this isn't going to council. We have a, a council meeting following this. This is just that committee. So the committee, we're done with it at this point. Um, and there are costs to things like even Facebook because there's staff time attached to it. So I believe what's going to be looked at is things that can be implemented from a procedural perspective and anything that would have a cost or staff impact would come back to a follow to a priority session. Thank you. All right, with that, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Councillor Ney and Kirby? In favor. In favor. All right. Passes. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Councillor Kirby and Ney, are you sticking around for this, the rest of the, uh, the evening, or are you uh, signing off as part of, just as part of the, the working group? Well, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think that answered my question, but I'll ask it again. <laughs> Councillor Kirby and Ney, are you... Uh, are you sticking around for the rest of the meeting or are you signing off? I, I would love to uh, return to my vacation and my family if that's, uh, if that's amenable. It's up to you. We're here. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then I'm, I'm done. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Ney? Yeah, I, I'll be. I'm out of the country right now, so I'm going to sign off. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. All right, we are moving on to item number, yeah, <laughs> item number two. I think we'd all wish we could sign off and go have a GNT at this point. Um, can we uh, move on to item number two, quarterly statement of revenues and expenditures? Uh, I'll turn to Ms. Carter, the Director of Financial Services. If there's any overview you want to make to this, it's a fairly clear report. Thank you, through the chair. Yes, it's it's a pretty standard half year report. Uh, any items that did have some variances, I uh, included notes, explanatory notes for those, so I would entertain any questions. Are there any questions from the committee? I'll move receipt. That's okay, you can move if you want. And we'll seconded. Go moved and seconded. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the public on this report? Seeing none, I will then call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, item number three, we're entering into the land use applications, and these all have slightly different processes, so I'll try and make sure I, I'm clear on each one. Um, the first one is an architectural siting and design for 237 King George Terrace. Uh, this siting and design comes to us because there was a subdivision on the property, and the uh, subsequent buildings to be built have to go through a siting and design approval process. Um, I'll just turn it over to Deborah Jensen, Ms., uh, the manager of planning to just give a quick overview of the application. Thank you, Chair. Yes, to follow up on your comments, so this application is coming out of a covenant that was registered to uh, a, an approved four lot subdivision at 237 King George Terrace. This is one of four lots that will be going through this process. Uh, lot three is a proposed uh, two-story home, contemporary in design, incorporating uh, stone, stucco, and metal elements. It's been reviewed by the advisory design panel who supported the application. They did offer some suggestions to improve the design of the home and those have been incorporated into the final design. Staff are re requesting council direction. Okay, thank you very much. And for those in attendance, the process here is that this will go the, through the committee. The committee will make a recommendation to council. Uh, and at the end of this committee of the whole meeting, we will reconvene as council and make the final decision on this. But given that we're recommending to ourselves, they tend to stand uh, by the recommendation. So um, with that, I will entertain any questions from the committee to staff or the applicant. I believe the applicant is, uh, applicant is here. I'm not seeing, oh, Councillor Zelka. Uh, letter, uh, sorry, question through you um, to staff uh, relating to, um, um, I, 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 had, I, I understand that this went through, um, uh, um, what do you call it, the AO's office, uh, AO. Um, Advisory uh, Design Panel? Uh, no, um, um, Approving Officer, the Approving oh. Officer. I understand that they're, they're, uh, I, I haven't received the information from the Approving Officer with respect to conditions uh, on, this, on this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this development approval. And I just wanted to confirm 
uh, to the extent that we're able to, uh, whether um, there are any outstanding conditions uh, with respect to the approval of this entire bare lot strata that uh, affect or don't affect or are still outstanding. Uh, wh what is it that we can know uh, at this point, please, uh, from the approving officer or her designate? Uh, thank you, Councillor Zelka. And we actually had a letter to this effect as well earlier today, so it's on the agenda. Uh, uh, Ms. Jensen, would you care to answer that question? Certainly, to confirm, all the conditions uh, through the through the PLA have been reviewed. They have all been met, and the subdivision plan has been signed off. May I do a, ask a quick follow-up question to that? Because one of the conditions, I believe, was the removal of the old house, and the house is still there. So, can you explain that condition? Certainly, um, the, you're, you're correct. There are some buildings that are still sitting on the site. They are required to be removed. That has been addressed through a covenant that's also being registered to the property, which says that no further building can take place until those buildings are removed. Okay, thank you very much for that. Are there any other questions? Councillor Braithwaite. Um, I guess, um, again, looking at one of the uh, letters that was sent in um, by a resident, it talks about... Um, the trees on the property um, and uh, also that uh, they feel that there was um, a large urban forest populated with various birds and animals but we also have a report in in the package that uh, from from an environmental report that says that there was no um, nesting birds uh, on this property so can we maybe ask a question around that to staff you may you may ask that question and Thank I would you. might further <laughs> Uh, are there any uh, trees also that are like that are removed and being replaced through this through this siting? We're really specifically dealing with the siting and design of this of this house. Yeah, what I can say is for uh, lot three, there are no trees on that site. There is a sh there is one weeping atlasier on the site that will be removed. There will be additional trees planted on the site. A and no nesting as far as uh, as per the. Okay, thank you. Just for the record, we had a head shake in answer to that question. For those listening at home, uh, are there other comments or questions that to be made to staff or the applicant at this time? Not seeing any. Are you okay. Asking the I'm asking the sorry. I, I'm asking the public at this point if anybody wishes to come forward and speak to uh, the to the issue. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite, can you just adjust that? Again, if you could just say your name and your and your municipality of residence. My name is Elva Jensen, and I live in Oak Bay. So um, I did write a letter, um, and um, I needed some clarity about the proposed Bearland Strata. I got a comment uh, through you, uh, the uh, chair, that my questions today would be answered, and I do appreciate that because we are in the dark about a lot of things. We'll do our best anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, first of all, I'd like to sort of frame um, one of my questions. I felt when I saw the information that we were putting the cart before the horse. It seemed to us that if they were already talking about building, we did not know that the conditions had been met. We got a, a letter that outlined all of the conditions. There were quite a few pages from two to five. And no one told us that there was a covenant and that those were somehow being bypassed. So we've been waiting to see that large house barged out and it's still sitting there along with the other ones. And so we were very surprised to find out that there was um, this coming forward. So my question in relation to that was, how could the director of planning um, in her, the summer report say that the subdivision had been approved. Now, I think maybe uh, that some of that is answered by saying that there is a covenant. Could you just explain that a little bit further through the chair? Sure, thank you, Ms. Jensen. I think it's been largely answered, but if I could uh, pass it to Ms. This is gonna be confusing with Ms. Jensen and Ms. Jensen, but here, we'll, we'll try this. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we've got lots of Jensen's <laughs> around here. To, yes, um, would you care to answer the question? Uh, hopefully I can answer the question. Um, yes, again, um, as part of a subdivision review process, we go through the initial review. Um, 
if, if the approving officer is comfortable with the application, that then tends to lead to preliminary layout approval. That sets out a list of conditions for the applicant to follow through on. Um, if the applicant then fulfills all of those conditions, they then come back with an application for final approval. If all the conditions have been met, then the approving officer can sign off on that application. It will be registered with the land title office. And so, so if I may just yeah. clarify, because I think there's a logical follow-up to that. So in the cases in this case where there's been an instance like the house, it's just been dealt with through a covenant to, to, to allow that final approval to go through. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Ms. And, Denson? And I was just wondering then, is it clear then that there, there is no building on the site until the covenant has been honored? Ms. Jensen. No building permits will be issued. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then another question. I was wondering how you're able to isolate one house in the development when the design approval process for the development said that four lots need to be considered. Ms. Jensen? I believe what Ms. Jensen is referring to. Sorry, that <laughs> I know. sounds so awkward. <laughs> yes, Ms. Jensen. <laughs> Uh, the advisory design panel looked at the overall development as a whole as to how the houses would work in connection with each other, but ultimately the siting and design covenant is for each individual house. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I was thinking how lucky we are not to have Mayor Jensen here to tie this all <laughs> up. Um, I guess I am just uh, would like to make a, a comment about the advisory design panel. I, I feel that this process has been very rushed. I was at the meeting on July the 3rd for the final hearing of this. The minutes of that meeting aren't even out, and they are re recommending what the de design panel said without us having any record, any written record of it. So I don't like the fact that it's been rushed like that. So I quite have an explanation about that. I'm not sure how much explanation that's sort of a process piece, but I'll, I'll pass it back to staff to answer that question. Uh, just a bit of history with the design panel. Um, this proposed subdivision, proposed at the time, has been to the advisory design panel at their April, May, June, and July meetings. So council has seen the bulk of those minutes for these, for these lots. Um, in terms of moving it forward now, there was no intent to bring this application forward until we had actually confirmed whether that subdivision was going to receive final approval. Uh, in terms of the process, it is, it is following due process as we would with any other application. Uh, could, th through Please, the chair, uh, I was at that meeting on July 3rd, and I heard um, Ms. Jensen say at the end of the meeting that if the subdivision was approved, so at that time, the subdivision still was not approved. When was the subdivision approved? Ms. Jensen? Last week. Okay. What date? Do we have, I don't think that matters that much. I think it's the important thing is it's between okay, that meeting and Okay, but it was now. not at, at July 3rd. It still wasn't then. Okay, thank you. So you can see why it's been very confusing. Um, so I guess my other question around the, this was, why uh, are, why were not the conditions removed and then the plans for the lots? But I guess maybe that's been explained. Um, another concern that I have is a confusion over variance. Now, when this was this development was first proposed, we were told that the variances had been agreed upon. And then when we see the final report, it says there were no variances. So I checked back to see where we got the information about the variances. And I think it was at the Advisory Planning Commission when we first heard from Ms. Jensen, who was then the Acting Director of Planning, she gave us a report of the development of 237 King George Terrace, and it said the variances had been granted. Now when we get the summary report, she says there are no variances. Let's so I'm wondering if there's some difference between a subdivision and a bare land subdivision, and if some of that could be explained in terms of the variance. Sure, thank you, Ms. Jensen. 
Uh, Mr. Johnson, that we have a uh, confusion over the use of the term variance on these different pieces. Could you, could you explain? I do appreciate, by the way, you submitting these questions ahead of time because it allows staff the, the time well, to actually I, do this. I, so I do appreciate, appreciate you uh, asking them to be prepared because <laughs> it's good to hear the answers. Yes, thank you, Ms. Jensen. Uh, so to confirm, variances are nothing to do with the subdivision specifically. Um, the initial um, development permit that was approved by council um, was to consider a, a structure that was in place in the foreshore, specifically the swimming pool. There were no variances attached to that. So in the development permit itself, there are some standard clauses with respect to any variances that are approved. Um, you'll likely note in one of those clauses it actually shows an NA because there are no, are no variances, it was not applicable. With respect to the application that's in front of council tonight for the siting and design, there are no variances attached to this house. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I just would like to make the re the um, point that a bare land strata breaks a lot of the rules for R three zoning, and I think that the community needs to be made aware of that. And I would like to see staff and council make people more aware of what the parameters are for bare land strata and how they can lot average um, the size so you can get larger lots and smaller lots and also you can average the tree canopy which I think destroys some of our urban forest. So I think we, I would like to recommend that we be clearer and that maybe that through, that Oak Bay develop some guidelines for bare land stratas because they seem to be coming more and more popular. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. And I, just one other little comment to end. It's just a suggestion, listening to pub public engagement and some of the concern about the packed agenda and the time. Um, why don't you start um, doing public engagement right now? And I suggest maybe you table the next council meeting and live the, get, get, let the public have a chance to hear some of these issues and bring it back to council in September when people are back ready to start the fall. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And, and I will say this, uh, this application and the issues that have uh, been raised uh, by you and your husband uh, at that time have changed some of I think it's raised the awareness from both on council and staff in terms of some of the the, the notification processes and some of these pieces. So I will say it's been a bit of a learning process for everybody in this one. So please come to the mic. Uh, so my name is Earl Jensen. I risk making an additional point here after my wife has spoken so well about the issues on this project. I think that uh, the public has been shortcut by the decision in terms of the number of houses and stuff they can put on that property and that it's going to affect the waterfront. It does affect the habitat for uh, all kinds of eagles and other birds. Uh, the otter that was there and the squirrels that were there and a lot of the songbirds that were there. And I would just submit that no, no nests were found because they visited on four different occasions, never asked any of the local people whether or not there were nests there. And the local people were not allowed to get onto the property to see whether there were, not, there were nests. And uh, the other question I've got is sort of a legal one. Um, how can you possibly use a covenant to achieve responsibility for certain things that were supposed to be done on that property prior to consideration for final approval? It seems to me that legally, the public and us and other neighbors who are concerned about this have been shortcut by that process. And I would ask whether or not the use of the covenant in that particular case is even a legal kind of uh, avenue to, for the, uh, to follow in terms of getting the final approval. Uh, thank you. And we can't address the number of houses because that is a technical process that goes through the approving officer um, here. But I will say, uh, I'll, I'll just hand over to staff. Does staff have any comment on the, on the use of covenants in this case? So section 219 of the Land Title Act sets out a, a series of provisions for wh where you can and cannot use a covenant. In this case, it is possible to do so and all of the legal documentation has been vetted through our legal counsel. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, you're welcome to come back. Uh, so one follow-up question. Why don't you in the first place indicate that those issues will be covered by covenant 
and that they can proceed and then you don't make them as a make them as a prior requirement at all and expect the public to see the government in Oak Bay achieve uh, the standard it sets out in its document. I mean, there's a double standard going on here. And I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Either. I think I'll just leave that one alone. I think in some cases it's just efforts made to allow the process to continue uh, in exceptional circumstances, but I, I'll leave it at that. I have one more speaker. Mr. Muirs, you've already written down your name. Anthony Muirs, uh, South Oak Bay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering what is going on here. I'm, I'm kind of lost in the process. I've been involved in this quite a bit, basically on interest in the community. Um, so does this make the uh, district liable if, we, if this is approved? I see it's not in the council meeting to, to pass it uh, if it's approved here. Um, what it is, is it? Wh why have we got one house uh, that's on the foreshore? There's built being built on the foreshore, development permit area. Why is wh why one house and why a design? I mean that seems. And then all the other reports that are being presented, we've been asking for. We, we, there was no geological report in the first place, which we've been asking for, and that never came forward. Um, and now we have a, a we have one. Uh, we spent uh, I think it's been six months trying to get the Arbor's report. And now we have a tree report that suddenly sprung up. Um, I don't understand why all these reports, they're not connected to design. So what, what is, what's, what's, what's happening here? I, I, I'd like to find that out to start with. It seems kind of odd. We've never had to approve, I've never seen that. I've been in all council meetings. I've never seen one, one instance that's, this is very unusual that we wouldn't have a look at the house to see what it's going to look like. We'd, the building permit would be, the building, uh, you'd see a, a, a plan of the, what the building would look like. None of this is happening here. What, what's happening? Does that make sense? I mean, it seems I'm, to me I'm that. I'm loathe to throw I'm, what's happening to I, staff. I'm, but I'll, uh, I, I talked to staff about this and they said, um, it's confusing. <laughs> it's complicated. That, that, that's the two words they used. Yeah. Because I asked, is, is the house going to be removed? When is it going to be removed? So and just they don't I can, know I can probably they don't. clarify some of this process. The so. design panel is discussing blowing the rock up in the bay, um, which I don't know why they're doing that, but that was a discussion at design panel. Um, it's sort of very strange stuff going on. Anyway, I, I have some questions. So let's start with my questions, and you can answer my what we're doing here in a sec. Um, the, the preliminary approval report says that the developer had 180 days, right? Uh, and then if that, and I think if it wasn't completed, if the, if the conditions of the preliminary approval report weren't met, he had a, could apply for another 180 days. Well, that was April 2017. So I think we're past 200, the, two, two 180 day periods, aren't we? Uh, 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 what, what status, what's the status of, of I'll of put that question to staff. Staff, okay. is this application still open? The application is not open. It has received final approval. It's not open. The subdivision application has been completed. What we're dealing with today is just the siting and design in lot three of the, of but, uh, the isn't house. Isn't it dead? I thought it was that, that means that, does that, I mean, First of all, nobody got the, 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 uh, the approval report, right? The preliminary approval report was not presented to council. It wasn't presented to CAL. It wasn't presented to the, 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 the advisory uh, um, planning commission. So just and yet they're making decisions on it. Well, I mean, that's sort of highly irregular, is it not? So I only found out about it from Sanich, who said there would be one. And then, they, then we got it released. Mr. Mears, just let me, I think we need to have staff answer that. But this is an approving officer process that we're talking about, which we're not talking about tonight. So, but I'll, I'll let the staff answer the question because it doesn't come back to council for the final approval of the subdivision. I could put that to Mr. Anderson or Ms. Jensen. That is correct. The role of the approving officer is very much removed from council, so any applications for council do not go through th this particular meeting. So in this particular instance, the subdivision was applied for, it has received final approval, and now the applications in front of council are specifically to do with siting and design. So I didn't hear that. It has received final approval? It has received final approval, yes. The subdivision. So we're down to the siting and design of the buildings in the four lots So now. the 
So the approving officer approved final approval, is that okay? Yes. Interesting. <coughs> if it makes you feel any better, we don't get notification of that either. It's just a, a technical process that well, it goes through. Well, I'll tell you, um, I'm, I'm shocked that the public never got any uh, prior knowledge of this. I mean, if this, if this development didn't get any kind of public interest uh, announcements, then I'm, it, it's, it's on the most sensitive environmental area in, in the province. It's on the, well, the waterfront. It's next to a park. It's on a scenic drive, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not in the public interest. I wonder what does, what is in the public interest? Um, all right. I'm not like arguing with you one or the I other. I didn't have much time. I, I didn't know this was coming forward because it's. Uh, um, I, I was told by the planning uh, department that the, when I asked about the cabana and the, um, and the greenhouse that was going to be uh, converted into a residence, which would have been another residence as big as the houses that are going to go in. We don't have any design. Uh, uh, a look at the design that's never been dis d discussed. Um, so I was told that I didn't know what I was talking about, that that was never the intent is to uh, have a guest house as big as a house there or, to, or the cabana to be remain, which is not what the um, preliminary approval report says. Um, then I was shown by an architectural plan that's prescribed by the uh, uh, subdivision bylaw that says that all the buildings that are proposed and are going to remain has, have to be provided in a sketch. They showed me that sketch. There was no cabana and there was no greenhouse. And they told me that was good, they were gone. Yesterday they were still there. So either they reconstructed them or they didn't know what they were talking about at the, at, 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 in the planning department. So I'd like to know what the status of those two buildings are if I could. I'll let, it, I'll let the question go, but we are here to talk about the siting and design of the house well, going Well, we've got there, all these so. other reports that are talking about, you know, the development, so I can't understand how we can, you can't have it both ways. You either tell us, that you don't provide these reports after the fact, you either provide them first, or you... I appreciate that. If you that. can't shut me out, okay. No, no, so, I just... So, so can we have that status? Mr. Mears, what, what? Mr. Mears please address, address me, please, oh, on this sorry. one. Okay. But I, I just want to point out that you're right that this doesn't go through this body. I right, mean, this is right, just a right, subdivision right, process. Right, right, we are right, largely, right, we are right, largely right, out of this right, loop here. Right. So I'm going to allow okay, the question, okay, but it doesn't okay. relate to the, sure. to the, to the piece of I just want to hear. I'm turning that yeah. way. I'm not going to... Mr. Anderson or Ms. Jensen? Is the command of basically staying, I guess, is the question. Based on the uh, architectural siting and design applications that we've received so far for all four lots that have all gone through the advisory design panel, there is no intent on keeping any of the buildings on the site. All of the houses have been designed in such that there would be no accessory building attached to them. Okay. Those will be forthcoming. Okay. I've got two more comments. One is, Please. if you read the, 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 the preliminary approval report, it has a lot of conditions. They haven't been met. That all the plumbing is supposed to be done, which is all the pumps. They're going to pump all the sewerage out. That's not been done. How can you have final approval? It says right in the, in the, 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 the approval report, the, the preliminary approval report, that they have to be met before it's approved. So that it's been approved, and none, the conditions haven't been met. There's conditions in the environmental report that haven't been met. The, there's, there's, uh, the, the Highways Commission is supposed to be telling us if the if the entrance is uh, uh, approved. I don't know if that's been done. So, so there's a lot of problems here. Okay, the other misconception here is an approving officer doesn't have carte blanche decision making. You know, council sets policy and guidelines and they follow them. They see that the bylaw is, 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 is con conform with, but you have to set some policy and guidelines and we don't have any, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mears. Ms. Patterson? You've already got your name down from earlier. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just, um, I did send in a letter outlining a few things, but I just wanted to touch on. Put it down just a little. Oh, bit. sorry. Is that better? Yes. I just wanted to touch on um, the last design panel meeting, which I also attended. Um, and the, the minutes are not out yet. 
I must say this, this in the process for this application has been, I have found very odd and I've attended these types of things across Canada. So certainly the process, whatever it is in Oak Bay, and I, I, I'm still trying to figure that out. So, Acting Mayor, I hope to clarify one more piece tonight. Uh, when the design panel met, a good uh, amount of the time was spent with the members of the panel talking, uh, really asking questions and, and wanting information on mitigating water runoff and the equipment required for that. And so certainly when I attended the meeting, I'm thinking, well, all right, whose responsibility is it? Uh, the chair was clear design's not supposed to do that, although you would think that the members of a design panel, if that was an important consideration for them, would have access, would have been directed where to get that. But because of this, um, the comments at the design panel not being clear as to what restricted conversation they would have at the design panel, where issues like that, where the information would reside and how they could obtain it. And because of another um, uh, application that's coming forward tonight um, about, uh, and, and this is related to the equipment. So if there is water mitigation, if there are pumping, um, pieces of pumping equipment or emergency generators, generators required. I'm not sure now in Oak Bay what body actually looks at those so that equipment that is, you know, mechanical or electrical that impacts on perhaps the design, the layout, the configuration. I'm not clear as to where the responsibility where that resides and how it is checked in the drawings. Because certainly if there are more subdivisions on the ocean front and, and we're pumping all of this out to our, our district uh, lines, that matters. But also with climate change, um, equipment like heat pumps, air conditioning equipment uh, that take up space, that create noise, um, and that affect more than just that homeowner. It affects the neighbors. You know, I would like to understand more clearly where that is examined in this process and how it all comes together. Because in looking at this application and another one that's on tonight's agenda, that's not clear to me. Okay, thank you, Ms. Patterson. Um, I'm trying to keep this to the siting and design portion of this, and uh, it's really not council's at this really at the end of the day we should be setting the policies i agree there's some lack of clarity on the policy side uh, there's covenants in place with the fire department to look at sprinkling there's there's a myriad hundreds of pages of, of technical work that goes on behind the scenes you know, obviously if there's deciding the design has to change because they missed something then it's going to have to come back to us to get that approval done but i think we have to at this body treat it as uh, we respect the skills of the staff and the people who are responsible for signing off on those and it comes to us. I don't know if that's a policy piece you want to look at broader than this one application, but at this application, I don't think this is the, the meeting to kind of look at that policy. I, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw it to staff if there's anything that, that they feel anything different on that front. Um, maybe I'll speak generally to just the process for a second. So when we receive any kind of application, and in this case, siting and design, <coughs> um, one of the things that's done is referred out to our various departments. So um, you are correct. We do have professional uh, staff, such as our engineers, who are looking at things like off-site servicing, how we, how we have pumping systems going to the street or not, our building officials who are looking at how that house is going to function. So all of that information, all of that review takes place operationally as part of that application. And that happens before it gets to advisory design panel or to council. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Uh, if I may, just to clarify one point and then make one point about the uh, approval of that house. Uh, was there a second or other documents issued just, just as, temporary, um, as, as temporary authority for that subdivision? 
So I could you or was it the only the first just... 180 days that, for which that there was a preliminary authorization? You're asking about the time frame of allowed yeah. preliminary and then extension? Yeah, I'm at, yes, I'm asking about the uh, administration related to the fact that if there wasn't a second uh, permit or document issued or if the uh, previous one wasn't extended, then in fact there was no authority to even do the preliminary things that they've been doing. All right, I'm just going to ask the question, was there authority to approve this application? Yes, there was. Right. I'm going to leave it there with staff. I have to. Without, without so uh, w would you offer to give me a copy of that if I come into the office tomorrow, or do I need to go through uh, finding that out through legal three-month challenges? Uh, I don't know, but you can make the request to staff. Uh, well, it's the approving officer that would have issued it, and they should have it if I'll, they I'll have I'll turn it. to Mr. Anderson, who's signaling at me, but I'm not too sure what that signal means. No, a light uh, microphone on, please. I'm used to that just happening now. No, I just don't. Um, yeah, you, you need to pursue that uh, through other means. Like through an FOI request? Is that sort of the process? Yeah, the approving officer function is, is very clear that it's with the approving officer. He's asking though if there's if he wants to, to double check that things are legal that 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 request process for the timing of their documents and so forth would go through be a request of staff obviously and it would go through either a, a direct request or through an FOI request. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask that we take this offline and just you can ask that question of staff tomorrow because it's not a it's not a council decision at all and I want to get to our decision making process. Okay, the the one question I have about the house is that uh, it's a very beautiful house that they have designed and they've. Uh, the builder should be very fortunate because he's had all these expert opinions uh, through the advisory group that's been dealing with his house. But if you look at the design of that, it's a two-story house. If you stand in front of it, it looks like a three-story house. So at any rate, uh, if each of those stories is 12 feet, that means you've got a, f a face of 36 feet or 35 feet or something like that facing on to the 15 meter area that which which isn't supposed to be affected by the house but uh, it appears to me that the area that's designated in front of the house on the actual lot before you get to the uh, 15 meter area is so uh, short that there's no way that you could even get in there with a hose to wash the windows uh, let alone build how is the builder going to build that house is he going to use equipment to swing all the all the materials over and then do the construction on the site? And uh, he may be able to do that in the first house, but what about on the second house that also has the same problem? So I'll pass that question again to staff. We have a, uh, a shoreline development permit area that requires no disturbance. So is that part of the criteria in the assessment of this? Uh, when this particular uh, application first came in for the house on lot three, it was actually sited up against the 15 meter setback. It has since been pulled back. Um, while it's still, I would say, within close proximity to that 15 meter setback, the conditions that will be set on any building construction will still be around protecting that setback area. So we're putting silt screen fencing in place. They will not be able to go within that area. Okay, I missed the. The question is a good question to ask, and it does directly relate to our siting and design approval process here. So I do appreciate that. Uh, all right, any other people from the count from the from the public who wishes to comment or have questions? I don't see any. I'll bring it back to count to the committee. Sorry, at this time, uh, are there any other questions and or comments, Councillor Zelka? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I have a, a, a general comment and a so general question and a specific question. The general question has to do uh, just a moment has to do with um, uh, relating to the approving officer and uh, policies and guidelines. Uh, I do understand that Section 77 of the Land Titles Act does give the approving officer, um, uh, you know, the uh, where, where we they're appointed and uh, subdivision approvals go basically go through that that particular act. But I also understand that. Um, uh, approving officers are supposed to act in the best interest of the public. They're supposed to comply with provincial acts and regulations as well as bylaws. Um, so I wanted to ask, in a general sense, to start with um, to the buildings and inspection staff. Um, if council had policy, uh, a council brought in, um, for example, 
something like a public engagement toolkit that made reference to something like um, staff being a facilitator of information and not a gatekeeper, and there being, for example, an open government philosophy. Would it be, if, if that was a council policy, would it be reasonable for the uh, approving officer's approvals to be made available without FOI and being actually provided to council with the proviso, with the understanding that we could look at them, we just couldn't comment on them? I think just, can I just make this in from a process perspective? It's a very hard question to ask as an ab like abstract. I think the appropriate process, and if, if you buy into this with me, if you think that is something you would like to see us do, uh, it'd probably be worthwhile just to sit down with staff, talk to them, get a sense of that, and then bring it as a motion to council to kind of consider if we're going to move that piece. I think that's probably a better than trying to ask the, the sort of the more abstract questions here if that's possible, because I think we're going to have a hard time getting to that. Is, are you amenable to doing that? It, in general, um, uh, Chair, I, I absolutely understand what you're getting at. Um, so um, uh, what I'm asking is, uh, is staff amenable to me approaching them and asking them that question? Because if the answer is no, well, then just say no, in which case we save a lot of time. Yeah, I would okay, thank be you. shocked if it wasn't yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So the, then my more specific question is relating to the siting and design. I noticed in the geotech report that the crest of the foreshore slope is at or near six meters geodetic. Uh, did I say that right? Ge geodetic, excuse me. Um, which suggests from this professional engineer's opinion that this house is not subject to flooding through the year 2100, uh, 21, excuse me, 2100. So um, we've got a good 82 years before the opinion of this engineer runs out, I guess, in some ways. Um, is there any suggestion uh, whether, uh, from a planning horizon, whether we need to consider anything longer than 82 years, please? I think it's very prudent for anybody to give opinions that are the average lifespan of a person. That's <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're Ms. Jensen? Uh, yeah, standard practice through most of the local municipalities right now is looking at a 2100 year time frame um, based on some of the new data that we've been seeing, some of the work that's been done with sea level rise, uh, and looking at an average uh, time frame for, for any kind of construction. Thank you. Yes, I, I absolutely agree with, with you. Not only uh, sea level rise, but also with the uh, with the advent of the potential er earthquake and subsistence of the um, of the land moving down while the water is moving up. The combination of that is making uh, um, uh, estimates of what's happening beyond 80 years very difficult to uh, to come up with. So, uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, confirm that. Uh, that this uh, building, uh, in fact, all buildings that are uh, below six meters might be subject potentially to flooding. Thank you. I'm looking for a motion. I move the staff recommendation. Second. The staff recommendation is to approve. Any further discussion? All right, I'll, I'll just say a couple of quick words here. I think on the siting and the design, um, I, I mean, I, I think it's hard to not approve it. It's had good review. I do think the, the the sizing of it, and particularly when you get multiple of the larger buildings on the one side, I think it's I think it's the massing is quite substantial. I think it was addressed that that three-story face on the on the ocean is going to look large, um, but I believe that uh, that is just a reality given our current zoning that is allowed to be built, and uh, it's hard to refuse this given that it meets all those criteria. So, um, with that, I will call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? One opposed. Councillor Zelka opposed. Thank you. All right, I'm really trying to get through these quickly, but it's not working very well, apparently. Uh, item number four, Upland Siting and Design. This is 3175 Exeter Road. Um, just for the record for that last one, it will come back to uh, the, f the special council meeting after the fact to uh, for final approval by, by council. Item number four, Upland Siting and Design, 3175 uh, Exeter Road. Uh, Ms. Jensen, can you give a quick overview of this application? Yes, again, this is for siting and design within the uplands area. So there's an existing house on the site now that's proposed for removal. Uh, the applicant's proposing a new two-story design intended to reflect a French country style. Uh, the application has been reviewed by the advisory design panel who offered up some suggestions, uh, for example, some window refinements, driveway realignment, uh, exterior massing and stone detailing. Uh, they've also pushed fencing further back onto the site to retain more of a park-like setting. Most of those recommendations have been incorporated into the final design that you have in front of you. 
Uh, staff have reviewed the application. No significant design issues are noted, and the home meets the requirements of the zoning bylaw. Uh, and just for clarity, because we this question came up at the site visit today, there are two substantial trees that are coming down, and they are being replaced. Is that correct? That's correct. There is one in the rear. Uh, there's also one in the front driveway area. So that will require four replacement trees, which means basically a, a net zero loss of trees. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go to council if there's any questions of, is the applicant here? Just raise your hand. Thank you. Um, are there any questions of the applicant or of staff? Councillor Zelka? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I guess our first question to staff, maybe through to the applicant. Uh, I noticed that um, just before the analysis begins on page two, it talks about how the um, the fencing has been pushed back to maintain the park-like setting of the uplands. And I, I, I do notice that um, in that area that some fences are starting to go up. Uh, but I couldn't tell from the drawings, that where was the fencing pushed back to, please? Ms. Jensen? Uh, the initial drawings had the fence um, so you have the fencing that's on the, the side of the property. They were also proposing fences that would come from the side of the property over to the house. So it used to be further forward on the house. It's now closer to the rear of the house so that you can see more of the oak trees in the, basically the front yard. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? See now, is there anybody from the audience who wishes to speak to this application? Anybody in the public? Seeing none, all right. Then I'll bring it back um, to council. The recommendation. Second. Thank you. The recommendation is to approve. Uh, I'll, any further discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed. Thank you. The process at this point is uh, this recommendation will go to the special council meeting following this meeting for final approval. Uh, item number five, architectural siting and design, uh, 2176 Windsor Road. Uh, very similar process to this one. Uh, Ms. Jensen, just a quick overview. Yeah, this was part of a two-lot subdivision that was initiated with the Heritage Revitalization Agreement. So the vacant lot under consideration tonight and the Heritage Home that's on the building next door. Uh, the new owners are proposing to build a 1,400-square-foot bungalow on the property. The house itself would face Roslyn Road with a carport accessed off of the lane. The house itself has been designed to reflect the character of the neighbourhood while picking up elements of the Heritage Home next door. Design supported by advisory design panel who have made a, a, a few revisions to the cladding materials and the entry columns. These have also been incorporated into the design. Thank you. Are there any questions of the applicant or staff by council, or by committee, sorry? Yes, Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to staff. Um, I couldn't tell. May uh, maybe there is. There uh, there's some, there's appears to be some uh, stairs. Do those stairs go up or down? Uh, I, I presume they go to a basement. And is, um, uh, or do they go to some sort of attic space? I couldn't tell. Thank you. Is this a two-story house or it's a, a, sort it's of a, a basement? It's a one-story house. But, but is there a full basement? Okay. Yeah, there Jensen? Be, yeah, there will be a basement in there. That is a, uh, it is a one-story house. One story, okay, thank you. Excellent. And uh, just to confirm, uh, this was the lot that possibly was going to have a house moved onto it, and then that was sort of canceled, and now so this is the replacement for that. If I remember correctly, there was some plans years ago to move a house. Yeah, that's yes, correct. That's At the time, we were looking. Uh, the the owners were looking to move right. a house on there from another part of the area, but it's new owners and new building. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak to this application? This is a uh, two one seven six Windsor Road. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to council. We'll move the recommendation. Second. All right, we have a move and seconder. Uh, yep, yeah, moved and seconded. So. And a question. Go ahead, please. Councillor Zelka. Thank you very much. I guess uh, uh, related to the uh, approval, um, uh, next door is a heritage home, I understand. Uh, has, has this gone through heritage? I just wanted to, I don't remember seeing heritage uh, comments here. No, it, it hasn't. It went but through. Heritage yeah. revitalization. Yes, the, the revitalization agreement went through the, the Heritage Commission. Right. The siting and design is, has not gone through the Heritage Commission. And it doesn't need to because of the. Yes, That's thank you process. very much. Okay, great. Seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. I just want to say for the record what a lovely house, house is. It's small, uh, well below the 0.4 to 1 ratio allowed, uh, very in keeping with the uh, heritage, the very classic and important part of our heritage from St. Michael's University School there. So thank you to the applicants. Uh, the process there again is it will come for formal approval at the follow-on meeting after this one. 
Item number six, architectural siting and design. Um, this is for 591 Island Road, coming to us because it's part of a covenant. Uh, Ms. Jensen, can you give an overview, please? Yeah, that's correct. There's a covenant uh, attached to the, the overall subdivision that requires any exterior modifications to the home to be approved by council. In this situation, the owners are proposing to replace aluminum windows with wood windows, replace patio doors, remove one window, and add a trellis along one side of the home. The advisory design panel advised the changes were an improvement to the home and recommended that the application be approved. They did offer uh, one suggestion in terms of expanding the uh, trellis further along the side of the house, which has been incorporated into uh, the design. Uh, the overall site is heavily screened with mature trees and other vegetation, so we don't foresee any, any challenges. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff or the applicant from the committee? Councillor Zilka. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, because I'm relatively new to Oak Bay, uh, why is there a restrictive covenant on this property, please? Ms. Jensen? It goes back to 1985 with the initial subdivision, so. <coughs> uh, this is part of the Jones Estate subdivision originally. I'd move the staff recommendation for approval. Second. Okay, we have a mover and a second, but we have yet to go to the public. It's okay, That's, it all works. The uh, We're gonna go to the public now. If there's any uh, input or Comments, questions from the public on 591 Island Road? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the committee. We have a motion on the table. Any further discussion? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? Again, the process here is it will go for final approval to the special council meeting following this meeting. Item number seven, we have development permit application for 1159 Beach Drive. Uh, Ms. Jensen, you're up a lot today. Yeah, so this application is for works undertaken at the rear of a multifamily building which is adjacent to the Oak Bay Beach Hotel. Um, adjacent to one of the units, a patio was installed including laying down some paving tiles, constructing a, a low height screening wall, and undertaking some plantings. The applicant is requesting approval of the proposed works which will be supplemented by additional plantings. The Advisory Planning Commission considered the application and did not feel that the works were in keeping with the objectives of the shoreline development permit area. Uh, in support of the application, however, the owner has provided a series of documents prepared by a qualified environmental professional indicating the works have improved the immediate environment and Green Shores approved plantings will be added. Uh, staff have all considered how the works meet the guidelines that are set out in the development permit within the official community plan and the results of that are laid out in the report. Thank you, Ms. Jensen. Uh, I'll look to the committee for any questions of the applicant. Is the applicant here this evening? Nice to see you here. Thank you. Uh, of the applicant or of staff on this one, I, I believe we have some guidelines around the, the, uh, the green shores, that the foreshore development permit area for those who aren't familiar within 15 meters of the shoreline. The request is really that anybody doing work within that has to get a permit and any changes be made to a net benefit towards a green shores model. Uh, and that's kind of the question I think in front of us tonight, are, are these modifications uh, neutral or an improvement to what's there right now? and uh, to support the application. Councillor Braithwaite, you had a question or comment? Yes, I was actually just trying to find the picture that I wanted to talk about. Um, I, I noticed that in the um, information that uh, in the staff report, it talked about um, there being a walkway in front of the unit that provides common access across the seaward property. Um, and I couldn't actually see where that was. Is it, very, is it the walkway that's closest to the window? And if so, um, I think that there's a place where there's a picture that it looks like it's blocked to be able to walk all the way around the building. So I, can you just maybe address that? Uh, I have not walked around the entire perimeter of the building, but I can tell you that there is a walkway that runs completely down the side of the building uh, closest to the Oak Bay Beach Hotel, and then you can access around to the, to the rear of the building. So does that, so it doesn't go right against the window then of, of, of this particular unit? It, it's down further, closer to the shoreline? Uh, no, not on the shoreline. So there is, you can see a formal walkway that runs down the side of the building. But the bulk of that walkway is not within the 15 meter setback. Once you get around the corner of the building, it opens up more into the, <laughs> of the, the patio character. Thank you. Councillor Croft. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, uh, Chair. Acting. Just chair. Chair? Yeah. yeah. You don't want acting mayor? Okay. Um, to, to staff, I, I, I'm curious, uh, 
this is part of the strata plan and not part of the common property. I take it that that's correct? It is within the common area. So the, so the applicant is the strata corporation that's making the application? The applicant or the, the owner of the one strata unit is making the application with support of the overall strata. Okay, so he has an agreement. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions from Council? Yes, Councillor Zelka. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I, I couldn't find uh, the uh, geodetic uh, height of this patio. Um, is there any uh, risk of uh, a water damage uh, in the next 80 years, please? To what, to staff? There's no changes to the height that's there now, but staff? Yeah, we, in terms of the building, we are treating this more in terms of, e even though it is a structure, more in terms of landscaping. There has been no change to the height. It really is um, um, patio tiles that have been placed upon clean sand onto the, the gravelly bedrock that was already existing. And just to confirm, um, this work has already been completed and essentially they're looking for a permit after the fact? Is that the intent with potentially additional um, um, uh, provisions? Because I, I, I do notice that uh, the sta uh, in your staff report you talked about how staff may make additional provisions, but I wasn't quite sure what they were. Ms. Jensen? Certainly. Um, if th you are correct, the work has already been completed. The applicant is proposing to undertake some more plantings um, in keeping with uh, Green Shore's approach. Uh, with respect to additional conditions, uh, if I could point you to the second attachment to, uh, pardon me, the fifth attachment to this report, which is the draft development permit, which would speak to um, looking at ways to protect any kind of uh, siltation going down to the shoreline, et cetera, as, as part of installing that additional planting. So would staff then be adding this to um, either the uh, uh, shoreline development permit, um, I guess, requirements or putting it on some sort of a title uh, covenant, please? The development permit would be registered to the title. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, just to touch upon something that Councillor Zelka brought up, um, if, if there is, it, because the work was done without a permit, um, can you tell me what the penalty is for that and what the amount would be? I guess that it would be they'd have to pay double or something for their building or nothing. There's no building permit attached to this. It really is about obtaining a development permit uh, to approve the works, and there are no penalties attached to development permits. Interesting. Thank you. I just for my clarification, the development permit process kicks in when there's substantive changes to uh, landscaping and or the installation of a permanent structure. So is it the, is it the installation of this, of this wall that was put in there that triggered the, the DP requ requirement? Yeah, that's correct. There are guidelines set out within the shorelines development permit area that speak to what exemptions would be within that area. So for example, light gardening would not be, you would not require a development permit that. In this instance, there was additional work taking place such as installation of that, of that small wall that you can see on, on page four. So that triggered the requirement for the development permit. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Brithwaite. Sorry, just one more question. Um, so is there um, the possibility that other units on that level would choose to go ahead and, and do another a patio as well, similar to this? Because to me, that's then where we might run into an issue that it's going to be patio after patio after patio after patio, and that would really change the look, I, I think. Ms. Jensen. So as part of this application, uh, there was some discussion about whether any other work would want to be done to the building. Uh, so we did wait for the strata to get back to us with that information, and there was no other interest in doing anything at this time. Um, we have also, uh, in b the beginning of May, um, correspondence was sent out to every waterfront property owner in Oak Bay, including anybody who lives within a multifamily unit, just to let them know that if they want to be doing anything within that area, they should be coming in and talking to staff and may, in fact, require a development permit. So just to follow up on that, so th that doesn't mean to say that if somebody did come in the future that we would say no, um, because the president has basically been set that this patio has been allowed, so there could be other patios allowed as well. I don't know if I would refer to it as a precedent, but rather what they're proposing to do, we would be reviewing in context of the guidelines that are set out in the development permit area. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Jensen. Councillor Zelka? We'll get through this meeting eventually. Well, we're trying. We're trying. I know. We're trying. Uh, so, question uh, through you to staff. Um, 
If we denied this uh, staff, um, what would happen? Ms. Shelton? Uh, if the application was denied, then staff would likely be working with the applicant to determine uh, how they will remove what's been put in place there or whether there's some way to modify and come back to council with a different application. Okay. Um, the reason I ask is that I get the impression this is almost like a grandfathered con uh, situation was already there from a long time ago that they kind of just added a, maybe a layer or two. Uh, and, and so they would be returning it to something that looks awfully similar, I would imagine. In other words, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, obviously it makes sense to, 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 to make this a legal, uh, legal nonconforming if, if necessary, but, but certainly legal. Um, but it, I'm not quite sure whether we really have a choice to say no. We always have a choice to say no. The ramifications of that are what they are. Right. Yeah. All but right. uh, there we go. Thank you. Are we going to ask the public if they have any comments or questions on this application? I'm not seeing any. All right, so I'll bring it back to council. Where's council, or sorry, committee? Got to stop doing that. Back I'll, to the I'll make a motion to uh, support the staff recommendation that this patio allow to be to remain. Uh, it uh, pre-existed; it's just been fixed up in a way. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm willing to stand by. Motion that. to approve the as of as okay. Moved and seconded now. Any further discussion by the committee? I see a lot of head shaking and looking around, it's but it's okay. I'll, but it's I'll, I'll call the question. If yeah, it's actually just it's, just, it's a difficult one because really, I mean, it's it's in there, it's in place. It's something that actually makes it probably look a little bit better. But, um, at, you know, they didn't come forward and get the permit before. Um, it's if we ask them to remove it, what's going to be put there afterwards? It, it's it's a really tough one. I'm going to support it because I think that that's the correct thing to do. Um, but I just really I'm happy to hear that we have sent out letters to every waterfront property because I think that that will really help things like this not happening. Because if everybody has been um, made aware, then we shouldn't be having anybody coming after the fact that they have done something because then I think that um, we would be well within our right to definitely deny something coming forward. So I will support this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my only comment on this, I think it's probably net neutral. What was there before, what's there now, better plantings, new wall, small. Uh, I feel comfortable within that framework of, of saying it's okay. Um, I also would just reiterate that, you know, I'm very pleased with that letter that went out uh, and I think education is really the answer to these situations. Uh, it's very hard for someone to know what the cutoff is on terms of what's going to trigger a building permit and what's not. And so the more we can inform people, people are pretty well-intentioned uh, on these cases and would quite happily come forward if they knew it, uh, but quite reasonably would expect that a small landscape change might not trigger such a, such a process. So um, with that, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Oppose? None opposed? Thank you very much. Moving on to item number eight. Out of 35, I'm just pointing this out. <laughs> Item number eight, uh, we have a development variance permit for 2939 West Down Road. Ms. Jensen. Yes, the variance is being requested for siting of an existing carport that's located at the front of the property. Uh, so the proposal itself is not for new construction, but rather to legalize the existing carport, which actually predates the existing owner. Uh, staff have been working with the owner on bringing some of the site characteristics into compliance with district regulations. This application addresses the siting of the carport, which also provides covered parking for the site, and the amount of paved surface within what is uh, essentially a limited front yard area uh, because it's located on a cul-de-sac. It's actually quite a narrow frontage. Um, an additional two accessory buildings are also being removed from the site, which brings the lot into alignment with the zoning bylaws maximum two accessory buildings. Okay, thank you very much. Are there, is the applicant here? Yeah, they're sitting there, thank you. Uh, is there any questions of staff or the applicant on this? Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. First question would be, um, I guess, for the applicant, because um, uh, I do recall that directly Let's see if I can get this correct. Directly south of this property um, was an, uh, a, 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 an application to possibly um, uh, build a house, like right across the uh, property line. Can I can I just ask the applicant to come forward because there's a question for you. We might as well question have you up here for. Thank you very much, Chair. For when it comes up. Uh, a question for for the applicant is uh, in the bottom uh, 
I guess the most, uh, assuming down is south, um, in the most southern uh, corner uh, of the property, is, is, is it wet down there? Because uh, I, I, I recall other people saying it's, it's rather there, there's an old spring in that area. I wanted to know just, to, just to it, how wet is it? I'm just, I'm just relevant to the application as this. Well, I, I noticed all the buildings that are there as well. I'm just to okay. yeah. uh, Bruce Wilkin, um, oh. 203 on Runnymede Avenue. Um, th this uh, application arose because we um, did a, quite a substantial renovation to the house. So over my time working there, which was probably a year, I didn't notice that there was any water issues. Oh, so fantastic. Thank you. Much appreciate that. And um, uh, is there any idea when uh, this uh, was built, even though it was a previous owner? Just uh, any idea how I would say the house was, the existing house was built uh, probably in the late 40s. I would say the car park was built in the 50s or 60s. So 50 years old, 60 years old. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Anybody from the audience wish to speak to this application? Please come forward. Just uh, for everybody who's interested, the process here will be this committee will consider the application. If they feel it has merit, it will go out for community notification and feedback and will be considered at the September 11th council meeting. Okay. Um, it's Sylvia Bradley and I live in Oak Bay. In fact, next door to this property. Um, when I read this, I, you know, I think the situation should be resolved in that I knew the previous owners and they had a very small car and a very small car park that they put up. My question is on this design here, is this what they originally did or is this the carport now? Because there has been a few changes in length, width, and height uh, to accommodate the different size of cars. So I'm, I'm anxious that we're talking about the same thing. Um, well, let me just put that question to staff. So the, yeah. the question is, is this, you know, is this the original? We're really considering what's there right now is what's in front of us as council, just to put that clear. So we don't, we're not looking at what was back. So we're just considering whether the current configuration of, of paving and carport as it exists today should be recognized uh, and, and legalized as a variance. In fact, um, Ms. Jensen? That mm, that's correct. The plans that are in front of you are for the carport and the paved surface as they exist today. Okay. Thank you. And the second point was I know um, that some two buildings are to be removed to make up the 16.5% that they need to have. And so I'm, um, will the take could, me down? Could you also just speak into the microphone oh, a little sorry. bit more? It's no, one can, no one at home can hear us. I have to make it smaller then. Oh, I've got it. Yeah, that's good. We can hear you now. Okay, I'm here. I can hear the echo. Um, so what I want to know is the two buildings that would be taken down to make up the 165 um, I think it was a shed and a small shed at the bottom. Does that make up the 16.5 that they require to make this work? Sure, thank you. And I, I Ms. Jensen, has, the, has those, does that building already been dealt with? Is that correct? We are working with the applicant as to which of the accessory buildings would be removed. It's not so much as, as a percentage, it is the number of accessory buildings. Okay, thank you. Oh. That makes it a lot clearer. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there any other, anybody else from the audience who wishes to speak to this application? Anybody else from council with comments or questions or motion? I would uh, recommend that council legalize the secondary carport and give notification. Second. Second. All right. Is there an additional comment? Uh, yeah, I just uh, normally um, I don't like to um, approve anything over the 25% of maximum paved surface, but this is a very clear um, special lot, and so um, that's why I'm going to be uh, um, voting for this. Okay, thank you. Councillor Zelka? Uh, yes, a quick technical question. Uh, what is the um, width of the front yard? I can't quite tell. Please. What is the frontage of this lot? Ms. Jensen? It's approximately 30 feet. So considerably smaller than your average frontage in Oak Bay for those not familiar with their bylaws. Um, all right, I'm going to call the question then. All those in favor? 
opposed? Not opposed. So the process here is uh, with this no uh, preliminary approval, it will go out for notification to neighbors uh, and the application will come back with uh, neighborhood comment to the September 17th uh, council meeting. Moving on, we have item agenda number nine, which is a development variance permit application at 609 Oliver Street. Uh, Ms. Jensen, if you can give an overview. Yeah, so the variance in this particular instance is for siting of a heat pump in the side yard of a recently constructed single family home. Uh, upon completion of the home, a heat pump was installed in the side yard, but unfortunately does not meet the required three meter setback for a heat pump. Uh, the applicant has explored other avenues to move and meet the required setback. Uh, they've looked at the rear yard or actually siting it on the roof of the building, but have determined that the current siting has the least impact and is requesting that two foot variance. Uh, in reviewing the application, staff also determined that the system itself does not meet the maximum sound level rating at property line. Uh, a number of sound readings have been taken at different times of the day to try and determine the sound level reading, but ambient noise just coming from the street and so on makes it very difficult to determine the level specifically coming from the heat pump. Uh, so the variance that you'll see in the report is based on the readings taken at 2 a.m. to best minimize the ambient noise and best reflect the heat pump. Okay, thank you very much. This is the same process as we had in the last one. It'll come, it, we'll consider this as a committee. We'll make a recommendation. If the recommendation is to move forward, then it will go for notification. If it's a recommendation to decline, then it will just stop at that point. Uh, Council, do you have questions? Uh, is the applicant here? Thank you. Uh, Council, uh, Councilor Braithwaite. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair, just to staff, um, our maximum, uh, when I read this report, I was quite surprised that our maximum um, decibels is at 40, whereas uh, it says that other municipalities, I believe it said, is at about 50. So that's uh, quite a, a disparity between municipalities. So that's a very interesting, number one. Um, number two, the difference between the 40 and the 53.3 um, you know, when you look at it mathematically, it looks like it's 33% louder, but that's not true when it comes to decibels, correct? Ms. Jensen? I'm not going to claim to be an expert when it comes to the decibels, so perhaps the owner will have more information on you. I know it was very difficult to try and figure out exactly what was coming from the heat pump because of all of that ambient noise. It's not a matter even just looking at what the, the manufacturer is offering up because the way the bylaw reads is what is, what is coming off of that at the property line. And then I guess if I may, um, one other question. It says that um, not only is it um, that much more in decibels, but it's also two feet closer to the next property line uh, uh, um, as to what our bylaw states it should be. And then um, I did notice that it says that they're going to build an eight foot um, sound barrier. And I'm wondering if that is in place yet, because in the pictures, I believe in the package, it didn't show that in place yet. Ms. Jensen? Yeah, and perhaps the owner can speak to this a little bit more. There was a temporary screen put in place to determine what the impact would be in reducing the sound noise of the existing heat pump. Uh, I believe if council were to move forward with this that they would be looking at putting something um, more efficient in place that would be a permanent fixture. Thank you. M may I just do a follow-up to that question? And would that permanent fixture wall then require a variance for setbacks? No, it does not. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Zelka. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm a question about this 10-foot wall. Um, it sounds like a, like a, uh, a fence. So um, if, if staff could help me understand how this isn't being treated as a fence, please, since it's so close to the property line. Ms. Jensen. Uh, it would be treated as a fence, so it would have to meet the requirements of a fence at that location. And isn't the maximum height six feet? The maximum height is based on, and forgive me, I don't have the fence bylaw in front of me, but it is, there's the solid part of a fence and then it's allowed to have a lattice work on top mm. of that. Mm -hmm. I believe it's six feet plus lattice Probably on the side yard. So then uh, uh, a lattice doesn't really stop sound. So um, uh, is the intent that there'll be sound proofing in this six foot fence or what is the intent to somehow mitigate the sound because uh, I, I actually don't have uh, a personally a concern with the setback issue what I have a concern with is the sound uh, I do note note um, on uh, certain noise level charts 
and being a uh, ergonomics uh, with some some training in ergonomics, a 40 decibel um, sound is like a babbling brook or a computer. Uh, 50 decibels is like light traffic or a refrigerator, whereas 60 decibels is like conversational speech, such as right now, and or and or an air conditioner. So um, uh, in our wonderful quiet Oak Bay. Uh, 53 decibels might be seem louder certainly than than what most people are used to in downtown Victoria this wouldn't even be noticed but here it might be so I'm just a bit concerned about the sound uh, so the question is, is any mi mitigation being done specifically to bring the sound level down perhaps I'll just the ask the applicant to come forward just to give a, a brief description of what it is that you're proposing to do to mitigate the sound uh, issue good evening here worship in your council same process, just a name and, and yes, Rob, Sh Rob Sharple is resigning in Sandwich. Um, this came upon uh, through a complaint, not uh, from a building official. Um, in the building, the heat pump was designed in the house where it is, but unfortunately, I missed the uh, bylaw. So the two feet was my fault. Um, we put a uh, double five eighths drywall in front of it to dampen the sound to the neighbor, and it seemed to work to keep the decibels. But cut them in half, I believe, what it showed from the first one. Uh, so that through my sound guy, he said a cedar fence with the insulation in between would work the same. So we put a temporary structure just so we weren't stuck with the one and then taking it down later. I may I just ask a question? Yes. Um, I know we've had these in past where people try to put fences around them, and of course, they require a lot of airflow for it to work. And so sometimes putting up fences, especially close to it, mitigates the effectiveness of the air of the air pump. Is that a concern right. in this situation? No. These heat pumps allow uh, 12 inches uh, fence in front of it because they have a side on the side of the heat pumps is getting the air taken in. So they're designed that way so that you can go up that distance. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant at this time? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to have a seat in the front there in case there's any other questions that come forward from the audience. Uh, is there anybody from the audience who wishes to speak to this variance request? Oh, we have a few people. Councillor Braithier, would you adjust again for me, please? We're going to have our own mic set up here. Yeah. Yeah, we see three mics at different levels, and they're just fine. Yeah. Ms. Patterson, welcome back. Jill Astor Patterson, thank you, Acting mm -hmm. Mayor. Um, this comes back to my first discussion about equipment and when it gets accepted in the process. Now, um, you know, I, this, is, this is going to be a growing concern with climate change in Oak Bay, but I know certainly just on our one street, this has come up three times, and I, I'm informed every time our staff looks at this when the drawings are submitted, and yet then it c comes back for variance with people trying to put their, their heat pumps in encroachment areas closer to the neighbor's house. It happened to my neighbor, and unfortunately I did, in fact, object because uh, it was coming too close to the side of my house where I use the space as opposed to being away from his space that he uses. So, in fact, the heat pump had to be installed some 70 feet from the equipment in the house, so that's a very long run for the cooling line. Um, but nevertheless, this, hence my first question, when is it, when does it, the actual use and purpose of the equipment and the aesthetics of the designs, when is it all pulled together and the, the drawing specifications reviewed by staff to perhaps prevent this from happening in future applications because I believe it will be a growing concern. Thank you. I'll put that to staff. I mean, do we, do we normally have these mechanical pieces as part of single family residence designs? I, I don't remember seeing them very often on the, on the plans. No, with the content of our um, building and plumbing bylaw, there's no requirement for inspection of heat pumps at this point. 
Thank you. But they are clearly included in the setback requirements. The zoning bylaw does set out regulations for any uh, equipment that's emitting noise. Um, we are fairly regularly having conversations with people about siting of things like heat pumps, but there's no requirement for, um, for building permit or inspection. Okay, thank you very much. You know, I, I'm going to actually go to the audience again, if, we c if I may. Are there other members of the audience who wish to speak to this? This looks like another adjustment. Uh, thank you, councillors. I'm Chris Smith, uh, South Oak Bay, uh, 596 Oliver Street. I'm a resident. I live right across the street from where the variance is being requested. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I'll be very quick. I, I don't have a 100-page uh, slide deck, so don't worry. I know you want to get going. Uh, but I would like to say that our street, which is the uh, where I live, is between Central and Beach Drive. There's been unprecedented change there. Some good, some not so good. It's a little subjective. So, you know, I am concerned about precedence, and I am very concerned about uh, the pace of growth. I will... Uh, commend though the developer they did a tasteful job at 609 so they did a fairly good job um, having said that though unfortunately the de developer at 609 uh, submitted their plans to the municipality um, without the heat pumps in the plan and I don't for whatever reason and when the final uh, product was uh, completed the heat pumps were surprisingly placed adjacent to the house um, in in breach of the um, of the zoning and unfortunately right beside my neighbor who will speak later right beside my neighbor's bedroom window um, so it does uh, have an impact and my wife and I because the house has been empty for the past year my wife and I when the the heat pump was turned on full blast we could hear it across the street and it was very loud because it is a tranquil neighborhood but I am concerned about my neighbor and I do think that uh, that is quite frankly unacceptable to have a heat pump right outside, um, right outside my neighbor's bedroom window, and that is negligence. So I would like to see some action taken. Um, we understand uh, the developer is taking some steps to mitigate this, so that we welcome that. Um, and in that context, we would like to respectfully, through you to the chair, I would like to respectfully request that at a minimum, a independent um, test be done to gauge what the true noise levels are because I can tell you from firsthand when it, the house was first built, it was extremely loud. And in front of my uh, neighbor's window, it is also loud. And I think in order to clarify that, we need an independent test um, that may not be at 2 a.m. Or, or whatever circumstances are. So I, th I thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Welcome to the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Mayor. Or <laughs> Another <laughs> chair. <laughs> chair. 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 Okay. <laughs> I'm... Uh, I'm David Holmes. I live at 597 Oliver Street, right next door to uh, 609. Um, the first point I, I like to make is that we're, we're not talking about a heat pump. We're talking about two. One's mounted on the wall right above the other. Double your pleasure, I guess. I'm looking now at the uh, report to the Committee of the Whole by Deborah Jensen, Manager of Planning. On page two, she mentions that the applicant has constructed a, a 2.4 meter tall screen. And as you can see, it is very temporary. There's no mention of a permanent screen. Yeah. You want to pass those around? Oops, sorry. Uh, it's also mentioned that the requested uh, setback is eight feet and a variance of two feet. Uh, that is incorrect. I measured the distance myself by sliding a tape measure under the fence, and it's 7.6, so it's a variance of 2.6, a small amount, but worth noting altogether. Uh, nonetheless, um, 
On the bottom of the page, he mentions there's no significant issue respecting the heat pump siding. Well, that's incorrect because on uh, October the 30th, I submitted a, a, a letter to the engineering department on that very matter. Over the page, uh, she says, and I'm quoting, the applicant has indicated they have installed the quietest heat pump system available on the market. Well, a good friend of mine who lives near Carnarvon Park has done a major reef uh, renovation on his house, and he installed a, a Daikin heat pump, which is at 48 decibels. And I got onto the carrier website today, and it there, and this is the carrier website, it says that it can be as low as 58 decibels. So it's by no means the quietest, and uh, who knows what the maximum sound is. The report further says, and again I'm quoting, the proposed location of the heat pump and screening will not be visible from the road as it is, in lo is, as it is located inside a recess of the home's footprint. Well, that is incorrect. I have a photograph that I took here today, and it is very visible from the road. Both the, both the fence and the, the heat pumps. I'm looking now at the Oak Bay Advisory Planning Committee minutes, commission minutes, and the members inquired if the heat pumps would run all night whether the neighbors are satisfied with noise level and screening. Well, they don't run continuously, but they run for about 60 or 90 minutes, and then they shut off, and you, you get almost get to sleep, uh, but 20 minutes later, they come on again, and you start it all over again. I've even, I've even had earplugs, put earplugs in my ears, and I can still hear the, the, ear pu the, the pumps. I'm looking now at the development variance permit. They talk about zoning bylaw 4.10.3, and they mention that uh, 53.3 decibels. Well, that's below what Carrier says their heat pump will do. So, so that's not going to work right there. I notice also on the Victoria. City of Victoria website that they have uh, a daytime decibel for residential areas, a daytime uh, decibel reading of 55, and at night 45. And finally, on the second to last page, the readings that were made at uh, 2.05 a.m., I was awake at that time. And I heard them turn on the pumps, and the pumps came on in their usual very loud state, and they were at, th they were at that level for a few seconds, and they, turn they then turned the down to what I think is a minimum. So these numbers you see here are not maximums, they are minimums. So why am I here today? Well, it's very simple. My wife and I want to be able to sleep at night, okay? So I respectfully suggest that you reject this, this variance application. Thank you. Is there, is there anyone else from the audience who wishes to speak to this application? I'm not seeing any. I'll, I'm going to bring give the applicant the chance just to stand up, and you can respond in any way you want to any of the comments made, and then we'll bring it back to council for consideration. Yes. Do you want my name again? No. Nope. We're good. Thank you, um, Mr. Sharples. So, if we do say there is a spot on the roof to put it on the roof, the heat pumps, the whole neighborhood is going to hear the heat pumps. It'll echo throughout the neighborhood and, and it would be within the 10 foot setback. Um, the neighborhood around, there's quite a few heat pumps in Oak Bay and I'm willing to do a study with the firm in Oak Bay to uh, give you the decibel report on other ones. Um, this is a very quiet unit. Um, we've done everything we could to make it quiet and it's very green too, right? So. Yeah, not much more <laughs> I can say on that. But uh, locating it anywhere else on the property, it would be louder. So, oops, sorry. Yeah. I'm hitting the wrong button there. Sorry about yeah. that. Uh, thank yeah. you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, cut it back to committee. Are there any uh, further comments, discussion? Uh, Councillor Croft. Uh, thank you uh, to the applicant. Um, what was originally intended for this house? Was a heat pump originally intended, or was it going to be electric heat and then was changed, or was it a gas uh, no, uh, appliance? It, oh, sorry, it was yeah. always designed for the top floors. We usually do a ductless heat pump um, for efficiency, right? Like it costs maybe like $100 like every couple of months to heat the top floor. And then the bottom floor has a separate heat pump with a backup furnace. So that's why you see two. But the ductless only sounds like a small fan. Like it's like they're very quiet. Um, it's the other heat pump that has most of the decibels. So okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Chair, uh, an, uh, another question. Um, has this screen been designed by an acoustical engineer that you're proposing to put there, or is it just a, a, a contractor with some ideas? I, Tim, who designs my plans, he designed that um, just from experience. But uh, like I'm willing for Wakefield here in Oak Bay to uh, design something if you'd like. Yeah. So. Councilor Croft. Uh, no, that's enough. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Braithwaite. Um, thank you. Um, I did look up while we were chatting um, about the different levels of decibels, and it says that a level increase of 10 is 10 times more intense uh, as far as decibels go. So it's similar to an earthquake, I guess, in that in that regard. Um, I, I struggle with this because um, as uh, Mr. Smith has pointed out on his street, um, there's been a lot of development on my street. There's been probably seven houses out of 30 torn down in the last um, three years. It's like a war zone on my house and my street. And we also have a lot of issues with heat pumps. So I can really commiserate with, uh, with, the, with the neighbor. Um, in a perfect world, we would come up with a solution that would allow um, the heat pump to stay, but the neighbor not be affected. Um, I'm not sure if we can get there, um, but I'm willing to try, and I'm hoping that the neighbor would be willing to try as well. Um, in that, um, you know, it, it might be an expense to the to the applicant to um, to have to try and build something to to mitigate the sound, and then do a test after that. But um, you know, it, I. I I don't want to have to ask the the, um, the resident to move the pump to another location um, because I don't know if that would work for, for that particular house. Um, but I also don't want the neighbor to have to um, put up with that heat pump for the rest of their time in that house. So it's it's a it's a toss up. So do we ask the the resident to? put out the expense and try to put a, a, a fence up um, and then do um, do a decibel count? I'm not sure if, we're, if we can ask that. I think the process here, frankly, and I'll turn to staff for guidance, uh, if we're, we're looking, I mean, I guess this boils down to is the issue with the variance just the noise impact on the neighbor and the location of that piece, uh, or is it more of a philosophical we shouldn't approve it? Uh, if it's the former, then I think perhaps we could look at deferring uh, this consideration until and, and give the app or the owner of the house a chance to actually build something, if that's the pre preference. It would be very possible that would be a sunk cost he wouldn't get back again uh, if it didn't meet the needs. And, and in many ways, in these cases, it's it's more the nuisance than it is the uh, the, the stricture of the law. So, um, staff, what do you have any suggestions here? If that we have the ability to defer this, obviously, and allow the the applicant or the and the applicant to, to try different things and come back again. Yeah, that's correct. You, have, you essentially have three options in front of you. If you are essentially okay with it, you could send it out for notification. You could defer it and provide an opportunity for the applicant to work with the neighbors or come up with another viable solution, or um, you can reject it. So, okay. Um, Councillor Braithwaite. So, I mean, I, I would th I would like to see if the neighbor would be uh, amenable to um, having um, uh, trying to have something done uh, to mitigate the sound. If they're not amenable, then I would have to vote uh, against this application or, or or deny the application to to keep the the heat pump. I I really don't want to have to do that because I agree it's good for the house, it's good for the environment. However, I have to take in my um, in my humble opinion, the rights of the neighbor 
over the rights of the heat pump. So if the neighbor was willing to work with that, um, then I would be happy to make a motion to that uh, regard or to defer it and, um, and, and put a time limit on it as well though because I don't think it would be fair for the, for the neighbor to have to put up with this for another month um, without having something done about it. So I'm going to actually just look to Mr. Holmes on this one. Um, I mean, is that is where are you at with this? I mean, I don't. Uh, we have no sense of the order of magnitude of the noise and and whether or not this will have any possible impact. I don't want to go down the path here if there's no chance of it succeeding. You have to come for the microphone to speak, unfortunately. But I'll call you forward. I mean, it's this is one of these sort of uh, yeah. We, we really want to find a way to, to to make it work if it can. But it, you have the experience here. Well, th uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not an expert in sound mitigation. I don't think anyone here on, on the council is. So I don't know if this fence is going to work or not. So if Mr. Sharples builds a fence and it doesn't work, where are we? W what's the next step? We're, I, I we're don't back know. here in September to, to consider it again. Well, okay. If Mr. Sharples wants to build a fence and it works, I'm fine with it. If it doesn't work, then I have a big problem with it. And that would be, I mean, sorry, um, that would be the intent of, of trying this. Uh, I'm just trying to do a, a good neighbor thing to see if mm -hmm. something can work. If it doesn't work, I'm totally on, on side with you that that um, heat pump should be taken away because it's disturbing your sleep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Croft? Yeah, I, I'm in favor of deferring the application subject to receiving an acoustical engineer's report on the heat pump and a mitigation program. I don't think they need to build a fence. I think they need someone to engineer a, a screen that will meet the needs of reducing the sound and then giving it to the neighbor to see whether or not they believe the engineer's report, you know, uh, or build a screen and uh, go for it. Uh, you know, it's a uh, it's, it's, it's two-sided thing. It's, uh, I think we need an engineer's report to say what can be done in this situation. Okay. Uh, my, my personal opinion of that one is I think it's probably much cheaper to build a wall than it is to hire an acoustical engineer to, to tell us what it might sound like. Councillor Zelka? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, having had a, a, a heat pump put in next to me uh, in a previous um, house that I lived in and uh, having my sleep disturbed for over a year uh, before uh, I eventually, I guess, I, I kind of got used to it, um, but it did take quite some time. Uh, I, I definitely um, I have a, a concern about this. Um, uh, I, I know we're bringing in lots of, uh, you know, uh, there's change going on, and I know this is actually heat pumps can, can potentially help, but unfortunately, it wasn't part of the original plan. Um, so it wasn't part of the original approval. Um, I would imagine uh, that if the sound, uh, uh, having some time to defer, I think is, is, is a reasonable approach in terms of a good neighbor policy. Um, um, possibly relocation of the uh, heat pump to the backyard where the sound now disturbs uh, uh, um, uh, the backyard area as opposed to you know, on the side area. Th th there's a couple of po possibilities here and I understand that maybe up on, uh, it, there's no flat roof so there's no option for putting up on the roof. Um, but certainly uh, where, where it's been placed uh, definitely, uh, uh, from what I uh, can imagine, only really amplifies the sounds and really directs it directly to the house uh, next door. So we seem to have some agreement here. Is I need a motion at this uh, point to defer to the, is it reasonable to defer to the September Committee of the Whole Meeting and allow that time, the next two months, for the mitigation efforts to happen? Is that a reasonable time frame? Can I just look for a nod from the applicant? Okay, I'm getting a nod. And I think that's not wholly unreasonable for the, uh, for the neighbor in this case. Uh, so can I get a motion uh, to that? I'll, I'll move to defer. Second. To the September Committee of the to Whole the September meeting. Committee of the Whole. Okay. And he seconded. But if I can just make a, a point that Please. I would like to see if you could have something done prior to the two months that it's going to take. Like ju it's July now, August, September 11th. Maybe something can be done quickly. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think we w we're looking for a thumbs up or thumbs down from the neighbor uh, by that point. You need some time to get that. So plus it would be nice to have some quiet in the intervening time. Uh, Councillor Zelka. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I want to point out, uh, with respect to uh, this potential uh, report and recommendations, recommendation number 36, identify co topics and review no notification requirements, such as tree, re tree removal signage, demolition notifications, street and sidewalk permits. Um, what do we call this thing? This is a heat pump uh, in installations. Um, in other words, they are expanding the variety of communication channels used and provide earlier notification and involvement where appropriate. It's already in here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Um, we have a motion on the table. I, I'm supportive of that motion. I think trying to find a reasonable method as long as it addresses the issue. I, 
I, we've, it's not the first time. We've had a, quite a number of <laughs> heat pumps over the years that have come through to council. Uh, usually when they're in the side yard, they cause problems just because the sound just echoes that much more and, and it has a higher impact. Uh, usually once they're moved around to the open space, they dissipate and that goes away. So um, I think those are that's just the reality of the situation. But let's try, and, let's try and resolve this one if we can. Okay, with that, I'll call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed. We'll see you guys in September. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I think the variance is coming back to us for approval no matter what. So it's going to come back. Thank you, everyone. So next we have item number 10, development variance permit for upland siting and, and upland siting and design. So this combines both upland siting and design and a variance. Uh, direct or, uh, Manager of Planning, Ms. Jensen. Yeah, so this home is actually located on the border of the Uplands neighborhood on Dorset and then has a lane running behind the home as well. Uh, the owner is proposing to update the exterior of the home by adding new bay windows and timber details to the front of the home and adding windows and patio doors at the rear. There is no change to the footprint with, with these proposed renovations. Uh, there's also a flat roof on the detached garage with their, which they're proposing to replace with the pitched roof to match the home. That requires a variance to the interior side lot line due to the non-conforming uh, siding of the garage. The advisory design panel did offer some suggestions respecting the fascia boards, window and door details, but we're generally supportive of the application. Those suggestions have essentially been incorporated into the design. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the applicant or staff by the committee? Seeing none, is there anybody from the municipal, from the public that wishes to speak to this application on Dorset Avenue? I'm seeing none. Can I'll I can make the recommendation? And notice. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call a question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Uh, so this goes out to the um, uh, Upland setting and design, I guess we'll just bundle it all together so the variance and the setting and design will come back on September 17th. Is that the process here? Okay, thank you. Correct. All right, uh, item number 11, the heritage alteration permit for 2390 San Carlos Avenue. Ms. Jensen. So this site is one of a group of five homes collectively known as Patio Court. Uh, it is a designated heritage home where some of the key characteristics of the site include the patio area at the front of the house. The building has suffered some water damage in the turret area, which is a result of water leakage in that patio area. To fix the problem, the owner is proposing to install new tile over the patio area. The proposed slate tile is in keeping with the color scheme of the home and landscaping across all five lots within the development, so it all flows together. Uh, the Heritage Commission reviewed the application at their July meeting and had no concerns. They supported the application. Thank you, Ms. Jensen. Is there any questions of the committee? <coughs> Seeing none, is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak to this? And I see none, so I will look for a Move motion. Move the staff recommendation. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed. Thank you very much. Um, this is just going to go to the special committee or council meeting following this meeting for final approval. Uh, moving on to item number 12, the recreational cannabis regulations. And if I could ask, up front, Ms. Jensen, this is a looking at regulation of business use, not this is not use of cannabis. This is the uh, the building use, uh, building permit use, et cetera. Can you just uh, give a quick overview of this application? Uh, I wish I had that much power. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so council did receive a staff report in March advising that the federal government was in the process of legalizing the recreational use of cannabis. Uh, at that time, staff advised the district must also consider how to best address the retail sale and distribution of cannabis. Uh, at that point in time, council did direct staff to bring forward a report with more options. So since that time, the federal government has passed legislation which comes into effect in October of this year. Uh, the province has also adopted legislation that addresses health and safety as well as a retail framework for cannabis distribution. So at a local level, the district must also determine how it means to address the retail sale and distribution of cannabis specifically within the community. The report that you have in front of you outlines two options. One would be to begin working on a set of bylaw amendments to regulate the sale of recreational cannabis, and that may end up looking at the zoning amendment bylaw, business licensing bylaw, parking bylaw. Um, part of that process would also be to consult with the public and other stakeholders, such as the local schools and the business community. 
Uh, the other option is to prepare a set of amendments that would effectively prohibit recreational cannabis until such time as council directs staff to undertake that process. This would effectively require any proposals coming forward to sell recreational cannabis that they would need to go through our rezoning process. Uh, given the number of initiatives that are currently underway and the current workload of the Building and Planning Department, we would suggest Council consider the latter option. Thank you, Ms. Jensen. Are there questions of staff? Okay, I'll ask a question. Uh, is there a, um, uh, there's sort of one or the other, but if we, if the, if the recommendation, which is to, to put a, essentially a moratorium uh, on this until such time as those regulations are produced, it does, does it stop? Will, will, will staff not address any of these questions until such time as council directs it to? Uh, or is that something that work will go on and, and, and uh, in the background while, while this moratorium is in place? Or prohibitions, or I should use the same term. As much as I would like to say that we could continue to work on it, um, we are under a fairly substantial workload at the moment. So in the short term, I would suggest prohibiting um, retail sale of cannabis is, is probably the most efficient option. So if anybody is coming forward and wanting to, to, to do something within the community, they can still come forward to council and they can go through that rezoning process. Council still then has the opportunity to, to provide input on it. Um, going through a, a, more, a more detailed process, I would suggest we're looking at developing guidelines. Where are they in respect to the overall community? What is its location? How far are they from schools? Uh, you know, impact on adjacent neighbors, parking facilities. It would be a fairly lengthy process to consider those pieces. Okay, and I'll, I'll get to Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson, do you have something to add? Well, just with respect to option two, uh, staff would have to do work on that. We would have to bring an amendment forward to council for consideration. So that in itself is an effort that staff will have to turn our minds to, to uh, try and bring forward through the next uh, three months. Okay, thank you. And just for my edification, because I read this first seeing it as a prohibition of use and wondering how the heck we could ever do that, then realizing it wasn't. Uh, and then second read through looking at it and looking at the provincial regulations, which are currently restricting it to liquor distribution sites for recreational. Uh, we don't have a liquor distribution uh, site in Oak Bay outside of the private uh, wine store. Does this, would this, it's, we're not anticipating this having actually a direct impact at this point because it doesn't come into our, our framework, is that correct? Uh, that is correct in terms of the, the provincial liquor stores. Um, the way the provincial legislation is set up, uh, anybody looking for approval to run one of these facilities um, has to receive approval from the Liquor Control Board. So uh, part of that would be the, the Liquor Control or the province referring that over to the local municipality who have an opportunity to provide input. They have clearly said in the legislation that if the local council provides a resolution that it does not support it or wants to make an amendment to that approval, that they must abide by, the, by that recommendation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, just out of your conversation there, um, would we be able to look at um, the legislation that's being developed by other municipalities and kind of steal certain things from theirs or would ours be, or would we not be able to do that at all? We'd have to start from scratch. Well, I think it depends on which direction you want to go. If we're talking about just in the short term prohibiting and, and letting them go through a rezoning process, we can look at our own bylaws to determine how best to do that. Um, want if, once, if we're going down that other road as to how to regulate these, then we would look at not only the public consultation piece and our own bylaws, but you can also look at other municipalities and what's working and what's not. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? I think. Councillor Zelka. Yeah, just to, uh, just to confirm, um, uh, this won't stop, uh, say after October 17th, this won't necessarily stop someone from um, illegally purchasing um, this product uh, in, in another um, a city or district where it is uh, available and bringing it into Oak Bay and using it in a legal way as per the CRD regulations uh, with respect to distance. Because I understand the CRD regulations basically is allowing smoking um, uh, of, of any substance uh, at, at a certain distances from, from 
properties and those sort of things that, that are built in that, that is being extended to cannabis. So as long as those uh, rules were, were followed at the CRD uh, level, uh, we're not, uh, all the only thing that this is proposing if we went with option two is to not bring in the opportunity to sell from a land use perspective within Oak Bay. That's correct. Thank you. Are there members of the public who wish to come forward and speak to this issue? Anybody from the public? No? Okay. I'll move the staff recommendation. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Uh, option two. Okay. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? Uh, item number 13, energy step code. Uh, Ms. Jensen, manager of planning, one last time here on this agenda item, if you could just give an overview. Okay, so... As council may recall, um, staff brought forward a report in May to discuss the implementation of the BC Energy Step Code in Oak Bay. Uh, that report provided an introduction to the step code, including items such as the potential costs, timelines, and public consultation opportunities. Uh, council subsequently directed staff to proceed with additional public consultation, which built on the engagement strategy that had already been undertaken in other municipalities, including the CRD and Victoria and Saanich. So a public information session was held on June 28th here at Municipal Hall, was open to both industry and residents alike. And we had a total of six people attend the session, two representatives from the building industry and four community residents. Uh, industry representatives provided comments discussing both the positives and negatives of implementing the program. Uh, while residents were generally supportive so long as educational opportunities were made available, um, both for the, for the community to, to understand what the energy step code was and to contractors to make sure they were familiar with steps to be taken. So in order to continue with the targeted start date of November 2018, which is the implementation time for Victoria at this point, uh, Council may now wish to consider directing staff to prepare building bylaw amendments to implement the energy step code, which would be brought forward to a future meeting of Council. Okay, thank you very much. Councilor Zelka. Uh, thank you. Um, and just confirming that uh, the, the step, uh, step one and step three mentioned on page uh, uh, three, uh, re regarding um, step three and implementation January 2020. This is in alignment with, uh, with Victoria and the various other um, uh, cities and districts and townships in CRD? Uh, it is in alignment with Victoria and San Charmi, the adjacent neighbors. Excellent. Um, I understand uh, in chatting with a couple of um, uh, builders that uh, they would definitely appreciate having a, 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 a level playing field where they're all essentially the same. So I can definitely su support this going forward up to step three uh, at this time. Thank you. What's in front of us today is step one only, correct? We're not, we're just, we're, uh, well, we are, just, no, just for clarification of process here, we're not really considering the entirety of the, op of the process. We are today moving forward to direct staff to, to implement step one by November. Is that correct? Uh, the, initial the initial report we brought forward addressed both step one for uh, implementation of November 2018 and then step three for single families, step two for, for um, larger developments for January 2020, and then we would say put a moratorium on it until we can see how that's working. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Councilor Braithwaite. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering uh, if there's any cost implications um, associated with this. Uh, questions of cost implications to the municipality or to builders or to, to the municipality okay thank you not really to the municipality we have looked at that but essentially uh, any work that's done from the energy aspect is going to be done through uh, an energy advisor which would be hired by the applicant they then submit that information to us to confirm that they have met those targets thank you any other questions seeing none um, I guess the question I would have on this one is that we, we had one piece of correspondence uh, from the Building Association just raising the concerns that having to hire an energy consultant and all these adds to the cost of building. Um, do we have any sense of what that looks like in terms of going through there? Uh, and is there, a, is there a market out there right now that provides those services uh, inexpensively? Because I know sometimes in the early stages that gets very expensive because there's only one or two agencies that will do that work. Yeah, the information that we're getting so far, both from the province and from the uh, Canadian Home Builders Association, is that there are enough advisors out there to manage the workload. That in addition to there are other um, up-and-comers who are actually going through the training right now to be able to, to do the work. 
In terms of cost, the for the advisor specifically, it depends on the amount of detail that they have to look at. You could be looking at a minimum s of six hundred thousand dollars range. Not six hundred thousand. Six hundred to a thousand. Six hundred to a thousand. All right. Is there anybody from the uh, public who wishes to speak to this? Please come forward. Just again, same rigmarole. Just give your name and uh, area that you live in. All right, thanks for having me, Mayor and Council. I am uh, Mark Bernhardt. I currently live in Saanich on Oak Crest Drive, um, but I uh, routinely work in Oak Bay and just recently actually worked on a house just down the street over here, which, for the record, would uh, easily meet step three. Um, and, uh, <laughs> sorry? No, it did not have a heat pump. Um, it, with a heat pump, it would have met step four. Uh, so, uh, anyways, I, I come today uh, because I am also the president of the Canadian Home Builders of uh, Vancouver Island uh, local. And we are a national organization. We represent uh, a little over 8,000 builders nationally and a little over uh, 2,000 uh, here in the province. Um, for uh, the, uh, the record, we are not associated with the Victoria Residential Builders Association. That is a different organization um, and uh, uh, um, not, not us. Um, so we are not uh, the ones that wrote the articles that are in your, uh, in your packages. Um, so we, we took the time to uh, attend the information session. Uh, I've also uh, read through the reports um, and we also participated very heavily. Uh, we were an active partner in the Victoria and Saanich um, consultations. Uh, those, those consultations were extremely thorough and uh, here in Oak Bay you have uh, the distinct advantage of now being able to essentially copy what they did. Uh, realistically, they are all the same builders. Um, there are no builders that only work in Oak Bay. Even Oak Bay contracting works outside of Oak Bay. Um, so, uh, so it's, I know, <laughs> weird. Uh, and uh, and so, so uh, we have the advantage of, of drawing on that, uh, on that experience there. I can't imagine even if we did uh, three times as much consultation here in Oak Bay, we would see anything different from what we saw in Victoria and Saanich. Um, Generally, we find uh, the recommendations proposed in the report quite supportable uh, to move to step one uh, 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 in November and then step three uh, following. Uh, those are supportable largely because it, it means regional cooperation. Uh, like was said earlier, regional cooperation is essential for our industry. Uh, it's, it's already very difficult to deal with, uh, with the multiple uh, municipalities and all the different policies uh, and uh, for our organization and, or for our, our, our members. And, uh, and to have that regional cooperation is, is enormous. It will benefit us all. It'll make everything easier. It'll make the permit desk easier um, for, for your staff, not only, uh, not only our builders. So, um, so that, you know, that's, that's a real great benefit to us all to have that, to have that regional cooperation. Um, I, I would also like to address a few of the rumors that have been out in the press uh, in regards to uh, two-step code. Um, uh, number one, it, it's mainly because uh, we need to do policy based on fact, uh, not fear, um, and, uh, and uh, ideally not paid advertisements that show up in the Times columnist. Um, uh, you know, journalistic content is one thing, but paid advertisements are, are quite different. Uh, in particular, one of these recently refer referred to uh, uh, a radon as a step code issue, um, and this was clearly written by someone who does not understand codes uh, or perhaps radon. Uh, and radon is governed quite heavily in a completely separate part of the code. It has nothing to do with step code. Um, and in fact, at the higher levels of step code, four and five were required to do a lot of ventilation, which would uh, mitigate any potential problems uh, from, from radon. So, and, and top it off, I, I don't know of any high radon tests here in Oak Bay. Um, I could be missing some information there, but, uh, but as far as I know, that's, that's not an issue here. Um, so, like I said, it's important to base it on, um, on fact and what we hear from people who have actually done it. Um, myself, I've built uh, now myself now six uh, buildings that will, will meet beyond step five, uh, it's the one we're working on right now. The reason I'm so dirty today uh, is because we we're building a, a house that will be about 70% better than step five. So this is possible, um, and, and for the record, the budget on that is under a million dollars. Um, so it, it is possible. My own house went to net zero, and we only uh, spent about $40,000 extra on it, and that's when we made every mistake possible. Um, so uh, it, it, it is. So not you're speaking in support of this. Yes, okay. in, to some, and <laughs> uh, it is getting late, so I'll, uh, I'll I'll sit down. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to hang around and answer any specific builder-related questions that you that you might have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so anybody else from the public wish to speak to this item? I'm seeing that. I bring it back to the committee. Or is the committee looking for a motion or for uh, the discussion? I would move the recommendation of option one. The staff recommendation. Main staff recommendation. 
Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Yeah. Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, with respect to uh, passive house uh, type of building approaches and uh, and the upcoming uh, solar roofs that are, will soon be available, where the uh, cost of energy that you're generating at your own home will make uh, uh, you're basically generating at your house, while you'll this uh, step three will essentially save you 20% of your energy costs. I think that's assuming uh, you'll be paying for energy, but one day with your generating electricity at home, you may not have to do that. So uh, it's still important to do. Uh, I think it'll still be uh, beneficial for the environment, but I do uh, uh, look forward to one day when we can all do a passive house and basically uh, provide energy back into the grid. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed. Thank you very much. Move adjournment. Seconded. I just want to make sure that people understand the process here. This this is our approving that step code. At this point, we'll now go to the council meeting afterwards where we're going to formalize our own recommendation. Uh, we have a motion to adjourn. Seconded. Call the question. All those in favor? Uh, call the question. Yes, all in favor. We're passes. We're now adjourned. We are going to step back into council meeting in about three minutes. And then we are going to, so if anybody on council or wishes to go, thank you very much. Please stretch your legs. All right, everybody, we're going to call this back to the, uh, the meeting to order. Is staff ready to, to start the council meeting? Deb, we're good? Okay. Okay, time is now 9.57. We're going to start the second meeting of the evening, which is our special 
uh, meeting of council. Um, this, uh, I will start off with the same acknowledgement that we acknowledge the lands on which we gather as the traditional territories of the Coast and Strait Salish peoples. Specifically, we recognize the Lekwungen speaking people known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations and their historic connection to these lands that exist to this day. Please note the video recordings are, uh, the meeting will be recorded by video, they'll be streamed live and available after the fact uh, on the archives. Um, here we are now. So I just we we're gonna we were gonna skip at least one of these items. I made notes. Uh, if we didn't move it forward from the committee of the whole, then we won't be dealing with it. If it's one of those items here, so first item up, we have minutes and reports. The council minutes of July 9th. Move approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion, comments, changes? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Unopposed. Uh, item number two, we have the recommendation for siting and design at 237 King George Terrace. Need uh, approval at Move adoption of architectural siting and design for 237 King George Terrace. Moved. Looking for a second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Unopposed? Uh, sorry, Eric Zelka. Councillor Zelka <laughs> is opposed. Thank you. Uh, we have 3175 Exeter Road, Upland Siting and Design. Move adoption, architectural siting and design for 3175 Exeter Road. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Um, now we have uh, the recommendation to approve 2176 Windsor Road. Move approval. Uh, adoption of 2176 Windsor Road. Second. Moved and seconded. All, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Um, move 519 Island Road. Move adoption of architectural siting design, 591 Island Road. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Um, we have the recommendation for recreational cannabis regulations. Move the staff bring forward bylaw amendments to prohibit the use of recreational cannabis within the community and bring these forward to a future meeting of council. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. And uh, number seven, energy step code. Uh, move the staff recommendation to prepare the necessary building bylaws, et cetera. Second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Oh, yes. Okay. You said yes, just as you just I was saying anybody opposed. It confused me. Uh, item number eight, mayor's remarks. I just wanted, to I'm going to keep this very short. I did attend the uh, July 14th tour of the Painted Pianos. And I just want to thank the Public Arts Committee, uh, all the artists who I'm not going to name here, but I'll, I'll give them in the minutes so that they're there. Uh, Oak Bay Parks and Recreation, especially uh, Karen Manders, who is uh, the Acting Arts and Culture Programmer, and stepping in very nicely. And uh, Julian Mulhall, who is the pianist who played so nicely at those. So it was a very special uh, annual sort of kickoff to the, to the painted pianos in our community. Um, I just want to acknowledge all the work that went into that. Uh, I'm now going to the public participation participation period, uh, which we hold at every council meeting, uh, that allows anybody from the public to speak to an item related to our community. Is there anybody who wishes to speak this evening? Anybody? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to item number 10. We have in front of us a request for financial assistance from the Greater Victoria Crossing Guards Association. Um, I'm just gonna ask, I guess, uh, Ms. Carter is probably the appropriate person to give a quick synopsis of this, and then I believe is the applicant here, yeah, uh, can, can come forward, and I think we'll have a couple of questions for you to understand the ask. Ms. Carter. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you know, effective July 1st, Beacon Community Services is no longer providing this service, and um, we did receive a letter from the Greater Victoria um, School District as well, um, indicating this and that the Victoria Confederation of Parent Advisory Committees um, um, has volunteered to take on the responsibility in the short term. So there is still budget funding available. Uh, that was set aside in the 2018 budget for Beacon Community Services um, that would be available um, if council so chooses. Okay, we have a couple of recommendations here around that. Um, so I'm going to ask the Greater Victoria Crossing Guards Association uh, representative to step forward. You can give us your name and, and just be, be clear. I, I believe there's it's, it's fairly obvious to, to move the money over that's there right now, but I just want to be clear if there's an additional ask on top of that, moving the money over. Okay, so my name is Audrey Smith. I reside in Saanich. Um, the Crossing Guards Association is brand new 
and so it's a learning curve that I'm on. Uh, so the the ask is not knowing what your where your fiscal year fits with the school year is what the concern is. So Beacon has finished their services at the end of the school year, June 30th, and uh, Greater Victoria Crossing Guard Association will commence providing services starting the 4th of September, and so moving forward through to June. So our budget, our budget year is the school year. And so the, uh, have, I do have it broken down for the 2018 year and the 2019 year, if that is more helpful to you. But the, the uh, overall amount of money that the association will require to provide the service at Willows for the two crossing guards that are deployed there at this time would be um, $12,000 for the whole 10 months. Okay, perfect. So Thank divide you. that by 10. And then multiply by four, and that gives you your. So our uh, our fiscal year, just to answer your question, is a, is an annual year. So okay, our so it's a calendar are, year. So it's a calendar year. Mm -hmm. So we we have money left over in our calendar year that was to be allocated for the balance of this calendar year, and we would allocate any future funds for 2019 have to go through our budgeting process for 2019. Okay, so and that's what where is, we're at. What is the date for that application for the 2019 year? Um, well, we have a recommendation in front of us that if there's a specific amount that you're asking for, we can actually just refer that to estimates at this okay. time. There is an application process, and Ms. Carter, maybe you can just speak to what the application process is for those funds. Through the chair, there's, there's a standing line item in the budget for the crossing guards. Um, otherwise, there is a grant and aid uh, program that uh, people can apply for additional funding, and that's typically in January. Okay, thank you. Kay. So I think you have to compare what your budget ask is versus what our standing uh, budget what amount is. Yes, what remains in your budget. Yes. Um, so, Ms. Carter, so perhaps you could answer what that. Are, What's, what is remaining in 2018 to be transferred over? In 2018, uh, so September through December, there is $936 per month. So if you multiply that by four, there's $3,744 available. Sorry, that would normally just kick in in January to continue on. Is that essentially what would happen at that point? And anything above that would have to go to grant and aid process, or do we have? Do they not get any money until the estimates process completes in, in May? Normally, it's just carried over into the next year, so the entire amount would be budgeted again in the, in the next year. If there's additional ask, then it would need to go through estimates or grant and aid request. Is that clear? It well, it it's clear. Um, the association has no money at this moment in time to be able to carry over the gaps in funding. So if the, if the timing for receiving the funding means that the crossing guards won't get paid. is essentially all the money that we're asking for is to cover the wages of the crossing guards. And as you're aware, minimum wage, they get paid minimum wage and they only get paid two hours a day. And their minimum wage just went up twice in the time that Beacon had, in this last school year, went up twice. So, and then it goes up again in June. So we're, that's where m the majority of the cost increase, why the difference between what I've asked for and what you've had budgeted. Okay, Councillor Croft. So if I understand this correctly to you, Chair, that we have $936 for the fall season, so that's 936 times four. So, yeah, time for the four, for four. So actually there's a funding shortfall already for the, for, for the fall period of, of, of Approximately uh, six hundred dollars. Three, yeah, two hundred and sixty-four dollars. Yeah, rough. Well, r well, roughly three hundred. December is a short two month two because so we only yeah. have three weeks instead of four. So weeks. let me so just let me just simplify yeah. this. So, yeah. so we so have so, we so, we so we understand that we have money, but we're actually have a shortfall. So you would have to apply to us for that shortfall yeah. for the fall, and then apply to continue to fund your program. Do I, is, do, do I understand that correctly, Chair? Correct. So as, as I understand it, we have the standing funding. If there's anything you want above that, you're going to have to do a grant request of, okay. the, of, of Oak Bay for the, for the incremental difference that you're looking for for the fall or possibly for the year, um, for, this, for your school year. So that we have some funds in our grant uh, pool that we have available for these sorts of situations. Um, and it should be, it, you have to just you make the application and we have to approve it or not approve it as a council. So I can't prejudge what that would happen there. Ms. Carter? Okay. Uh, through the chair. Um, there is funds set aside in the grant and aid uh, budget allocation each year, approximately 10,000 for council um, 
for spontaneous requests that do come in. So none of those funds have yet been spent for 2018. Okay. And is Kelsey. the grant process available online? And I've got con your contact information so they can question you if I'm lost. Yes, okay, through, good. through the chair, that's correct. I, and I just want to get this Sorry, back to you. Through you, to I can question yes, her yes. if I'm lost. <laughs> yeah, so I think just from a process perspective, just because we have multiple things going on here, if you, the best thing for us to do, I think, as a council is to approve the transfer of the funds so that it's, it, there's no, there's no hiccup, we can pay you. Um, and then you need to determine the exact amount of difference is and then make that grant application the staff can help you with that process Perfect. i don't think we need to refer anything at this point until you know those numbers we can't make a referral to estimates at this point but it's early now anyway it's yeah. oh, for, for next year numbers so yeah i know the numbers but okay thank you. so that's that's kind of where we're at so that'd, that'd probably be the most sensible way of going forward okay council braithwaite did you have a question or comment okay so i would need a motion essentially what's laid out here which is to approve the transfer of the existing funding to the so moved second new society uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? Thank you very much. So that funding is now officially going to go to you, but any additional you have to go through that grant process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, item number 11, we have tenants course resurfacing, and we have Mr. Ray Herman here to answer any questions. And I'm not going to ask you to step forward on this one, I, uh, but if there's any questions of Mr. Herman, I will. Councillor Zolka? A question through you to uh, Mr. Herman. Uh, is, is these the same courts that are used for pickleball? And um, if so, are there any special requirements for that other sport? Uh, through the chair, no, the majority of our outdoor pickleball ball play is at Carnarvon Park. Uh, those courts at Henderson are our premier outdoor tennis courts, and we've tried to use, um, leave those for tennis. I'll move uh, the staff recommendation. Moved and seconded. With the understanding that you could sneak on and play pickleball occasionally, I think we'll support this. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? Thank you very much. Um, we have item number 12, Oakway Fire Dispatch Contract Renewal. Make sure I've got that number right. Yes. Um, so we have Mr. Dave Cockle here to speak to this. The, there's a very long report with a lot of detail. So I think I'm going to skip the explanation unless people, there's a, anybody on council wishes to have it explained or talked to or have questions. Okay? Yeah, questions are great. So why don't we go to that? Councillor Zelka. What a mess, through you, Chair. What a mess, if I can s just put it just briefly in my personal summary. Um, I, I, is it possible that, that um, the Chief uh, could uh, uh, um, assuage my fears that uh, all um, fire uh, departments in the COD area will be able to talk to each other on the same radio channel? Is this true? Hopefully. Uh, with regards to where we are right now, um, with uh, some of the departments going to an offshore, um, we're going to be able to make the radio portions of it work, but not all portions of what's available on the radio will work, if that makes sense to you. Um, supplemental. Um, uh, so when I was on Crest, uh, I know there was a big push to, uh, you know, through ecom and, and, and all that other stuff to switch over to digital because it was going to make things so much better. Um, but and 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 we've got the uh, the uh, the band what the, the band bandwidth and everything. Um, so with this uh, split now between um, Surrey Dispatch and this local dispatch, are they uh, essentially going to have to have different service? Uh, provisionings, but on the same bandwidth, or uh, uh, just help me understand that, please, Mr. Cockle. So on the Crest, uh, through through the chair, apologies. Um, on the Crest side of things, uh, they're working to uh, with um, Surrey to make that portion of it work. I don't have full understanding of that because I'm not part of that RFP process. Um, with what I've got before you today with dispatch, ours is seamlessly through ecom. None of it will change. Um, and it also inter in, um, um, intertwines directly with the CRD s dispatch, which is also here in town. The only ones that will be different are Victoria and Surrey. And uh, my understanding is, is that uh, Victoria is in discussion with Saanich at the moment. So they're still in discussion. And that's, that's from the November report. So. Yes. Mr. Zelka? So with respect to the mutual aid agreement with Victoria, which isn't this, I understand. This is, that's a separate negotiation. That's not complete, uh, c uh, um, concluded yet. Uh, we have a core dispatch agreement. 
which includes uh, Victoria, uh, and we're still working under that core agreement. Um, my expectation is that's not going to change with what we're doing here. Um, uh, sorry to put you on, on, the, on the carpet this way. Um, uh, last question is, um, is the uh, net effect of this is that instead of paying $112,000 a year, we now pay $149,000 per year as a base fee. Is that the main difference between uh, one year to the next? That's the correction is that uh, we're, we would be moving to, uh, based on the numbers uh, June to July, because it's based on how many runs you do in a year. Um, as a uh, cost per call um, fee as opposed to a set fee, which is what they were proposing previously, which was based on 50% call and 50% population, uh, which is a significantly different number, way higher than what we're, was proposed here before us today. Um, so y you're correct in, in, in that uh, we would be moving to somewhere in the 140s uh, based on where our call volume is right now, which is still significantly less than where other uh, departments are at. Thank you, Chief Cockle. I called you Mr. Cockle before. I call I'm you good. Chief. Councillor Braithwaite. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, to the Chief. Um, Chief, thank you very much for the in-depth um, and informative report. Um, it's, I know it's been a, a long road to get here, and so we, I really appreciate the work that you've put into this, you and um, I'm sure the Deputy Chief as well. So thank you for that. Um, and um, I didn't really have any questions. Uh, I had one question that actually Councillor Zelka asked, um, and so I have no other questions other than that. So I would be prepared to make the motion to support option number one. So Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Say none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you, Chief. And one more item for you, which is a truck. So again, very fairly straightforward request here for, for spending capital. I'll Any questions of, of the Chief? I'll make the motion and I'm happy to see that they're getting a, a nice hybrid again. So thank you, make that motion. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any questions for staff, comments? Counts, uh, Chief Cockle? Just want to clarify on the hybrid piece. <laughs> <laughs> we are looking at uh, the most fuel efficient vehicles we can get. You, you actually can't get hybrids in pickup trucks anymore. They don't make them. So, But what they do make is computerized engines that shut down and, and move down and they're way more efficient than uh, what we're driving now. So I don't want to confuse a, an electric vehicle because it's not an electric vehicle. And Sorry, it's not I, available meant, I, in this, so I meant yeah. to say more fuel efficient, not hybrid. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> the, the minutes will reflect that, I'm sure. All right, seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Uh, we have, oh. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Um, uh, uh, um, Herb, no, Herbie, Herb, uh, the, 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 I wanted to ask uh, if it was possible if I, at, the, at your... Just be here quick. Uh, at, at that uh, the truck used by emergency, uh, emergency uh, management, uh, I know it's in really rough shape. Uh, is there plans to replace that anytime soon? Uh, we're still putting funds away in our capital reserve replacement to replace Merv. Okay. Um, it's a 1990 Chev van, uh, but every year council is putting money away towards that and we're getting closer. Thank you very much. Uh, item number 14, we have the we'll minutes of the budget. ADP minutes. Second. Move and seconded. Any discussion? None. Call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? 15. Move receipt of the Oak Bay Advisory Planning Commission meeting. Any Second. discussion? All right, I'm just going to comment that there are a lot, they're, they're lovely. The, uh, the minutes are so much more in depth in terms of what they capture and uh, having the alternate uh, opinions and the and the checklists and all these pieces, are, it, it doesn't fix everything, but boy, it makes a world of difference for us on a council to be able to look at those and understand the logic and the reasoning and the opinions that were expressed to help guide our, our, our conversation here. So thank you on behalf of council for that. Uh, it's a huge, huge plus and a huge move in the right direction, so thank you. Um, with that, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? Item number 16, Heritage Commission Minutes. Move receipt of Heritage Commission Minutes. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? Uh, item number 17, we have the Heritage Revitalization Agreement for 2031 Runnymead Avenue, whose applicants have been sitting here patiently for a very long time, three hours and 15 minutes, and for years before that. So let's, uh, let's get to this question. We have uh, um, any questions of staff? from the council? No. Uh, we're looking for a motion then. I move. Oh, no, go ahead, please, Councillor Braithwaite. I just have one quick question. On the um, upper floor plan of the new building, can I ask a question about that? Is that okay? 
Um, it it says um, bedroom oh. number two and bedroom number six. Now, I'm not sure, but when I counted the bedrooms, I'm pretty sure there's only three bedrooms, I think. Is that not correct? I don't know why it says bedroom number six. That's a typo. Good. We have information from the... So it's a typo. So <laughs> I was looking for those other three bedrooms, so thank you. <laughs> All right. Is that settled? Any other conversation on this one? We're looking for I, I move that uh, Council give first and second reading to 2031 Running Mead Avenue Heritage Revitalization Agreement to set a public hearing uh, to be held on September 17th, 2018. Moved and seconded. This is the point for discussion. Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? And I need a motion for to set the public hearing for September 17th at 6 o'clock. So, so moved. Seconded. Uh, that's a just in a separate thing. Um, and any further discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Unopposed? So that will go to public hearing officially on September 17th. Uh, following that meeting immediately, we'll have a special a meeting. Uh, the first item on the council meeting following will be to consider that application in its final form, the third reading. You're welcome. Um, new business and verbal reports. Uh, there's any new business? Uh, CRD, I'll just say, if you haven't had a chance to look at the annual report on the CRD park, it's worth a read. It's a fantastic document and very informative as to what's happening in our regional parks. Um, any other verbal reports? Councilor Zelka. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity to, um, to say that uh, I, I volunteered at the, um, uh, the house, the, 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 the Oak Bay owned house directly behind the CIBC on, on uh, the Hampshire house. Uh, that's been at least two to Verps. Um, I, I volunteered there on the weekend to uh, help uh, with some of the renovations, and had a chance to meet uh, some of the um, uh, some of the family that's going to be moving in. I just want to say that it's, I, I, I was most impressed at the professionalism of the organization and at uh, the work that was done by all the volunteers, and I, I was felt very honored and, and to be, to be able to participate in in that in that whole work. So just uh, I'm I'm pleased that this in this public asset is being revitalized. Uh, and that is becoming essentially a win-win. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Any other verbal reports? All right, I'll just uh, point out this Thursday, July 19th, the Heritage Conservation Area Working Group is holding another community feedback uh, session to get some feedback on the uh, guidelines that have been provided and uh, the discussion around which buildings will be included in the schedule. So I'd encourage anybody who's interested in that to come out. Uh, it will have further public input in the fall um, but it's important for us just to s get a taste from the community as to where things are at at this time. Thank you. Uh, so there's two sessions. There's one from 3 to 4.30 and one from 5.30 to 7 on Thursday. With that, moving on to item number 19, we have a development permit uh, for 1159 Beach Drive discussed Mo already. Mo I move the resolution seven. for the development permit. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed? Uh, item number 20, the Heritage Alteration Permit for 2390 San Carlo. Uh, move the development permit for 2390 San Carlos. Heritage Alteration Permit. Seconded. So Heritage Alteration Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? Move have adjournment. Have Quick, I, I need a seconder. Okay, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? <laughs> Still time to get to the pub. All right, with that, we are having our next uh, meeting in September. So everybody have a great summer, staff and council included. Good night.